But so what I wanted to talk about was, did you, had you seen the, um, the Franco Zeffirelli one, uh, adaptation before this? Yeah, I, um, I saw, that's the one they always show you in school. Like, that's the one they always show you in, like, high school and stuff. And, like, so I'd seen it then. Uh, hadn't seen it, I guess, in, like, 20 years almost, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was interesting to go back and see it. And the Lerman one was obviously huge when we were young, young, young yeah. romantics uh, out there. I had, yep. I had the soundtrack on CD. Yes, and it was a big soundtrack. It's like the Butthole Surfers were on that shit, weren't they? Like that, that was a great track that they had on there. I didn't this time around. I I didn't identify when it was playing in the um, in the movie. I think um, it's um, like there brief are, when they're on the beach. Yeah. There's like a brief scene. Yeah, yeah, and and um, but there's a but there's a few. There was there's a few um. There might have been one song, maybe, yeah, that does not, like, early on in the the movie, like, the first song that plays, it's kind of like a hip-hop track, it is not on the soundtrack. Really? It's not on the soundtrack album. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then also, the that like, there's, like, a little um, kid who sings in the movie a few times, and, uh, and he sings a version of... Um, when doves cry and uh the prince song and uh, that one doesn't make it on to the uh that that didn't make it get onto the soundtrack cd either but another song the everybody's free to feel good song that he sings is on the soundtrack dude i'm just thinking now when you're bringing up the soundtrack like there is not even like like movie soundtracks those used to be such a big deal i know i know the spider-man 2 soundtrack do you remember that shit? That was no, huge. I don't, I don't. I don't remember that. It was huge because it had that like dashboard confessional song, "Vindicated," mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and um, uh, "Stone Sour." That like that like Slipknot side project had that like. Uh, I know it well. Uh, yeah. I know it the project well because I actually saw Stone Sour in concert at R- the Mesa. Yes, I had some coworker who was like this. Um, he was like this like. He was very like working class guy, and he was an ex marine, and um, he was weird with women at work. Like he would like, <laughs> like he did not care about like any of that bullshit. Like it's Mercutio, he would just like yeah. hit on yeah. women at work and 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 you know get in trouble for doing that. And he did not care, which I thought was kind of cool. But um, but yeah, he was like, hey, you want to go see? Like I just moved here. I just, like, I didn't know anyone, and he was the first person to be like, hey, do you want to do something? And the thing was, was it was to go see Stone Sour on a bill, I don't remember who else was on the bill, except for, um, Power Man 5, <laughs> Power Man 5000, like, and this was like 2017, Andrew. <laughs> oh, shit, so yeah, okay. this was... I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. I may say that the mail is entirely hostile. No! In a resources. Life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. Yeah, yeah. Like I'd never heard Stone Sour in my life. I mean, maybe I had and I didn't know it. I mean, I did had heard Power Man that five thousand. It had been about, you know, over. You know, it'd been like twenty years or whatever. But I was like, sure, I'm down. And it ended up being a very weird night. <laughs> did you? Uh, were you into Slipknot during the Hot Topic craze? Um, you know, when I was in like maybe um, seventh or eighth grade, like I had heard Slipknot. And um, a friend of mine had their CD, and I thought it was really cool. Iowa or the uh... was that was Iowa their um, their their second album? Yeah, it was like their second major studio album with like, the goat, and it was kind of like holographic. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, 
I think I. I think I actually was more familiar with the first one. But um, but I also was like I was really into like certain, like I was I was definitely into like hard rock radio from that era, but um. But I never got the CD myself or any of their albums myself, and also their aesthetic, with like dressing up like kind of like, you know I don't know garbage man clowns. <laughs> oh yeah. It didn't appeal to my sensibilities because I was very much coming from, like, I'd already kind of fallen in love with, like, the aesthetic that was from, like, grunge in the right. 90s. Like, more of, like, this, like, I don't know, like, sensitive slacker rock guy in that, like, dressing up, dressing like clowns. Even if I liked their music, it was a little bit alienating to me. And there were other bands that were doing that, too, at that time. Like there was this band Mudvayne. I don't know if you remember them. Oh yeah. Like Mudvayne. they had makeup. And, yeah. They would the Mudvayne, Mushroom Head, like all those kind of like Ozfest like. Yeah. Acts at the time. Yeah. It was like, it's just strange because that was like a huge part of, like, the hot topic, time and like the mall culture at that time and. Yes. Speaking of which, yeah, this is another episode of Heavy Board, and you're, you're, we're talking with a mall expert. Speaking of malls, huh. yeah, Brendan from Tales from the Mall. Excellent podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Brendan, tell people a little bit about Tales from the Mall. Like, what would they get with it, your podcast, which I've been on listeners twice, Brendan and I. This is our third collaboration in the podcasting uh, arts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, the thing about um, so Tales from the Mall is just, um, I mean, it's like a very laid back um, talk show. I would say a talk show that um, you know that I record over the phone, over like you know, over the the what would you even call what phone communication is anymore? Like over the over over the cell over cellular over. The, <laughs> Um, and, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm, I've been reflecting on this, but I mean, I think that it's, it's mostly focused on like interviewing, you know, people who are creative or who are creators. I mean, I've definitely interviewed some people who have no creative resume other than they're on Twitter or something like that, you know? Oh, yeah. And I mean, I've been interested in Twitter personalities, but historians, filmmakers artists writers other podcasters you know and uh and to try and you know try and make it as relaxed and intimate as possible and then i also do a little offshoot of tales from the mall that you can also you know get on the tales you know on any tales from the mall feed um it's called after hours and it started out kind of focused on trying to you know deal with uh, film noir and crime fiction but i'm kind of expanding that so that it can just kind of be about any kind of grouping or uh, you know of media you know like we're doing today you know talking about shakespeare talking about some movie adaptations that's kind of the vibe of after hours but again i'm not you know it's just trying to be it's it's trying to be laid back and uh yeah that's what i'd say yeah, and again, yours truly is on there for a few of those after the hours and the regular episodes, listeners. Uh, so you have to go uh, give that a download, give that a like, give that a review. A review. So those are very yes. helpful. Well, you um, well you you debuted on Tales from the Mall on the after hours. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Reverse that, order then. That was fun. I mean that that was a good time. Yeah, it was. and I felt like that was, you know, that was like we were very free. We were very free to talk about whatever we wanted to, even though we had some some meat. You know, we were talking about David Goodis's "Shoot the Piano Player" and, and Truffaut's movie of it, um, and we went into all, in all kinds of different directions, and that was great. That was like a that was a legit hang. I think people, it's really going to hit them in the in the parasocial um, sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's what we're going to do today too, dude. Yeah. yeah, we're going to be going everywhere because today we're talking about uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, 
Or yes. I guess technical, like the title is the most excellent and lamentable tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. But most of us know it as Romeo and Juliet. Most of you have probably read this for forced to read it in high school, or you pretended to read it in high school, and you continue to pretend that you've read it uh, <laughs> at cocktail parties and all of that. But we've actually talking about the play, and then we're talking about, yeah, the 1968 Zeffirelli adaptation, usually the one they show you in high school if you have a teacher that's showing you the movie version. Uh, and then the 96 Baz Luhrmann, uh, Romeo and Juliet with uh, Leo, as uh, many will come to know, as yeah. dominates pop culture for Romeo and Juliet references now. But Well, yeah, well, it's so e- you could so easily pretend to have read it what with all the you know, what would all, with all the adaptation material out there, you know. And just like, it's weird, because I just had like, this episode isn't out yet, it'll be out when this episode comes out, but I just had an episode on Harold Bloom's like the uh, anxiety of influence. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this was, yeah, obviously he loved Shakespeare and he was talking about that, where he was talking about how Shakespeare, he claims, invented the modern human. Like the, the yeah. even, the, uh, you could even go as far as to say Shakespeare invented like the modern uh, idea of romance even like yeah well he and he says like well some people say like he invented <laughs> well first of all yes harold bloom right he had that book like shakespeare inventing the human it's almost like he's saying that he that that shakespeare like invented human consciousness like people right. overhear themselves and or from what i remember you know i'm not yeah like, you're I spot read... on bro yeah yeah okay okay cool cool yeah. me i had a little bit of um difficulty reading Shakespeare when I was in high school and I think that's fair you know you know I mean it takes a good per- <coughs> like it takes a teacher to really like explain it and make it make it real um but then when I was in when I was um I think I might have been a junior in high school um my dad and I went and saw King Lear some of my um, favorites, yeah. In mm. New York with Christopher Plummer, the great Christopher Plummer oh. as Lear. And I remember standing in line in um like an you know, like a sedan, like a you know, like a tinted window sedan pulling up and James Earl Jones getting out. Oh shit. He was gonna be there and my dad was like, I bet he played a Lear back in the day. And then we went home and my dad had this big collection of Shakespeare like multi-volume and he opened it up and the first page was a picture of James Earl Jones as Lear. And so he was right. You know, my dad. very And so I, so that was a, that was big for me, even though I didn't, I didn't fully get what was happening. Um, I seeing it, seeing actors acting it and, and give putting emotion behind it, emotion behind these like challenging, this challenging dialogue. Uh, I could I could pick up more of it, and then later on I saw the Tempest at the Globe Theater in London, and that was like, and I and there it was outdoors, it was light, and I could actually read along with the play, and so I started to understand it a little bit better. Do you? Yeah, because my my first experience with Shakespeare was the same. It was in high school, obviously, and then like you hear about it. You even even if you've never read it, you know certain lines. Yes, and then like you probably are forced to read it in high school and like yeah you don't really understand do you remember those like no fear shakespeare um i know what you're talking about yeah yes. they would like be at like barnes and noble <laughs> yeah basically yeah it's like a modern language version and it was the, oh okay the nice thing about it was that they did have it on separate pages so they had the one side would be like the actual language and then like the other side would be um, like the kind of modern translations so that you could kind of read it without like having to uh, dissect any of the uh, language. I just remember I had one of those in high school. Yeah. I, I think there were a lot of Shakespeare plays that they usually make you read in high school. Like I remember having to read Hamlet, Macbeth, sure. like, yeah, King Lear, uh, Romeo and Juliet, all of that. Um, and then, of course, in college, I majored in English, so I had to take like an entire course on Shakespeare, mm-hmm. and I read a lot of plays for that. <clears throat> and then in grad school, I actually took a 
another Shakespeare course then. So then you're reading all these same plays over and over again. But even then, like, I think reading it now, like, because my next thing is, is usually how, how it read for you. Like, reading it now, it was a different experience reading it. Like, I hadn't read it in maybe, like, 10 years. And I was just like, man, this is one of those things that it just gets better every time you read it. Like you understand more of it, you pick up on more of it, like, every single time you read it. And I have this, like, huge thing left over from undergrad and grad school, like the Norton okay. Shakespeare uh, collection. So it has, like, all of the plays and then all this critical writing and shit in it, too. Beautiful. Just, yeah, you know, my background is just, of course, I have this on my shelf. Uh, but the great thing about it is that, it, you know, they do have, like, the little kind of footnotes and shit where you can like they do explain some of that like uh some of the the words that like are we were like don't use anymore and shit you know chords for ladder you know yeah yeah and that's i mean and i mean you almost need that you know yeah especially um. So how did it read for you this time in terms of like, yeah, obviously something you had to read in school and all that. And you have background in studying this type of shit, you know? Yeah, but you know what, though? I was not, um, you know, I was not uh, that great of a, a student when I was in high school. Oh, you know, me like, either, yeah. I, I was very, I was just very like, in, and I, I was more interested in like, I don't know, like, performance i guess you could say like being funny and uh i mean and my teachers liked me and all that but um i remember reading it in high school in an english class ninth grade and i remember us watching a little you know like watching segments of zeffirelli um and uh and and then like us like begging our teacher at the time <laughs> to like see like the nude scene that's in it we like we like begged her and she did it and that was really cool. But this time around, I mean, it's I, I, I realized that I, 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 I missed so much and I missed so much from even like watching the movies. Um, like the first my probably my first exposure to Shakespeare ever was this the, the, the Lurman, um, uh the Lurman adaptation. But I think the thing that stands out to me is how much it is really about and and in reading it i get you know it it first of all i mean it was like i under you know it was it was i found it very easy to read and very good to read and i was struck by how um the the rise and fall of it all you know like the the the, the humor and then the seriousness you know it just like comes in and out and i mean i don't know you know i guess we can kind of get into what what I took away from it. But I think the one thing that I really kind of took away from it is that I'm not super, you know, the, it starts out right with Romeo and he's like in love with this girl. Um, and it's not Juliet. And I like forgot that that even existed. And, and the, the line, you know, in this, um, like, you know, the, the, the like the friar, right. You know, oh, he's, yeah. At first, I was like, this guy, the friar, is going to, um, you know, hook them up, even though they're just kind of like, it, it, he even observes, like, you know, how, how serious could this kid really be? Like, he was just desperately in love with this other girl, right? And uh, and now he's all of a sudden, like, super head over heels for her. But I think his, he re he sees in this potential to kind of heal the wounds of the, his society, of his community. And so that's kind of why he still encourages it anyway. But, um, but yeah, I didn't, and, and, and some of the, you know, the, 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 this attitude towards the violence that, that these, this, these two families are engaged in that I, I don't, I didn't remember that either, you know, and I didn't remember how wonderful, Kind of these side, you know, in many ways, you know, Roman, Romeo and Juliet are like the least of, and obviously there's young kids, you know, like, like, uh, I think, um, Juliet's like 13 years old, you yeah. know, she's supposed to be like 14 and I think Romeo's supposed to be like 17. I see. 
something I see. like that. Um, but I mean, but but th- those people, they're they're kind of the least of these um, of these people, you know, like like th- of these characters, you know. When when you really when it gets down to it, it's it's kind of all about um, these side characters for me, you know, Tybalt, Merc- Mercutio, Benvolio, those 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 characters. Yeah. And that really does, like, it drives most of the drama, too, because the people that are upset are the ones that go into the fighting and all that, like... Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, this is often called, like, the 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 greatest love story ever told, and it's it kind of follows that kind of up and down. Yeah, I mean, what I noticed right away, like, reading it this time, is just, like, the poetry side of me, like, the music in the verse is so excellent, and I want to get to this in the Lerman version in 96. I think they do a great job of, like uh paying attention to that like when like <clears throat> and I we'll get into that later but yeah just like the first thing like right away in the very first scene you know you have the kind of that classic kind of chorus stuff going back to the greek tragedies but just like mm-hmm. penis jokes right away yes. like the entire first scene is just like yeah samson gregory kind of uh just talking about like having sex like the ma- <laughs> the, the maiden yeah, heads all right the maiden heads yeah, yeah. <laughs> are they tool, are they tool? <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah uh gregory tis tis well thou art not fish if thou hadst thou hast been poor john and apparently it's is about his penis being small oh dear yeah I, uh, yeah, tis known I am a pretty piece of flesh. Apparently that's like talking about the penis piece of flesh. Yeah. All that kind of shit. Yeah. And then the biting of the thumb. Right, right. The fucking insult. Yeah, that kind of like starts the, starts their kind of sparring at the beginning you know well i mean and i mean they're they engage in violence right away pretty much they're kind of catapulted into this um and i guess um you know I, I'll, there's a line that i find rather interesting i'm trying to find it here um and i'm curious what you think and this is from early in the in the play let's see here oh yeah i got it I've got the text out. Oh yeah, yeah. the The quarrel is between um, the quarrel is between our masters and us, their men. And Samson says, "Tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I fought with the men, I will be civil with the maids. I will cut off their heads." Um, I don't know. You know, in when I when I heard that line, um, in Zeffirelli, he interprets it. If you recall, the Gregory goes like the quarrel is between our masters, and then he kind of goes like, "and us, their men." Or, and um, and I just wonder like, to what extent <clears throat> there's already like a commentary there about, I don't know, um, the difference between um, masters and their men, you know, and like how silly the quarrel really is. Because, I mean, do these men, you know, like, do they even really understand what the hell this is all about? Do they, they don't care. You know, it's just, I don't, it, I would, I don't even know. I guess it's, I guess it's tribalism, you know, in a way. It, oh, yeah. It's really, you know, and, and really what it is, it reminds me of, um, you know, and kind of how I would have uh, drawn it up myself, just kind of like taking the Italian context um I would have, you know, kind of tried to play it off like it was some kind of like, you know, mafia scene. And uh, I think the Lorman movie kind of gets at that a little bit, just a little bit, you know. Yeah, they and make I think gangsters in terms of like the polit- like the the universal like the thing that makes Shakespeare Shakespeare as so many people would say or as Bloom would say is like the fact that it is this kind of um senseless quarrel like that's really the reason like these the the men don't even really like what started the quarrel we don't even really know what started the quarrel it's never told to us in the story 
and you don't really need to know because it is just kind of like legend lore like it's kind of like they, they don't even know why they have this blood feud that's been going on for years and years between the families and even then like you there's that scene where like um uh the the montague or the the capulet uh uh head of household or whatever he just called capulet in the play uh Right when when they sneak into the party and he's just kind of like they're like oh like those are Montagues and um, he's just like oh well let them be you know like tonight's a merry night like we're not going to start quarrels you know even though they like snuck in and crashed the party you know uh, it's like kind of pick and choose it's like that's the very universal side of it whereas like people get very tribal with that. And, you know, you make all kinds of comparisons to the world we see today. People are get very tribal and they don't even really remember or know why. It's just like, um, I guess, like a sense of duty to yeah. your, like, lord, I guess, in the case of the play. Or, like, your, your overseers. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I wonder, I mean, I mean, I thought that was very interesting, you know, when... When, um, when Capulet kind of like says like, Hey, who, you know, like who cares? Like, right. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that Romeo is here, you know, um, let's not worry about it, you know, right now or, you know, we're having a party, you know? And, uh, he says, yeah, he says, Can, um, cause you know, Tybalt who, um, you know, I'll forever think of John Leguizamo. Oh yeah. Um, he says, you know, Uncle, this is a Montague, our foe, a villain that has hither come in spite to scorn at our solemnity this night. Which, that's not really, by the way, I think Romeo's motive um, at all. Yeah. And, you know, they like they miss they 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 underestimate. Um, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to go down this road too far. But they underestimate the power of love. And yes. and by the way, Romeo's there not to see Juliet. He's there to see is it Ro- is it Rosalind? Rosalind, right? And so he says, um, "This is our foe." And Capulet says, "Young Romeo, is it?" Tybalt says, "Yeah, that that to see that villain Romeo." And Capulet <laughs> says, "Content thee, gentle cuz, let him alone. He bears him like a portly gentleman, and to say truth, Verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well governed youth." I would not for the wealth of all this town here in my house do him disparagement. Therefore, be patient. Take no note of him. It is my will, the which if thou respect, show a fair presence and put off these frowns, an ill-beseeming semblance for a feast. He's, and then, you know, he basically says, um, he shall be endured. What goodman boy, I say he shall. Um, and then he says, you'll make a mutiny among my guests. You'll set cock a hoop. You'll be the man. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think he's just tr- maybe maybe Capulet's kind of like falling on, um, you know, just kind of a sense of manners and like respectability and not, you know, I mean, part of the part of this whole thing launches and takes off in that, um, you know, already kind of like the the whatever the, the prince, right, the, the people who are actually in charge of the, this community are getting sick of their feuding you know and so they're trying to keep it at they're they're supposed to be keeping it at bay and keeping it under wraps and uh and what happens is that romeo's love and this you know they obviously address this like kind of the irony of this in the end you know with the prince's speech that he gives to the families after romeo and juliet have died but it is kind of ironic that like like Romeo's pa- love passion is like inflaming this conflict, you know, and uh, and that's an interesting commentary to me. And and I think you know, and and I I read this and I and I watch the movies with a sense of like I understand what you know like Romeo. Romeo and Juliet are going through, but I also kind of feel like it is a little bit cautionary about like this, just like incredibly hot, passionate kind of like youthful love affair, the... you know, because these kids, these kids don't even know each other. Yeah. Andrew, you know? Oh yeah. And, 
And part of it, I think, is like this forbidden fruit thing that's going on here. Also, oh, kids yeah. love, you know, everybody loves forbidden fruit. Yeah. And I think, um, I think also that um, there is a certain type of person, um, you know, and this this could be just like projection on my part. Um, but it did make me think about this a little bit. Um, and maybe you can, I don't know if there's some, some wisdom within the text, uh, that, that might comment on this and I, I can't remember and I don't remember noticing it, but you know, there is a certain type of person who is not actually a capable of like real intimacy, yeah. you know, of having a real intimate relationship for whatever the reason. And so they are kind of like attracted to things that are unavailable or doomed as opposed to, Hey, this would be a good relationship that would, you know, that, that would go the distance, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that type of person, but yeah, I mean, I think that there is like, I, obviously there's other love stories that Shakespeare has written in this vein, like Antony and Cleopatra and stuff, or even, the comedies are pretty much love stories like the taming of the shrew and all of that are, you know, these kind of different, you know, worlds apart kind of love interests that come together and the kind of, like you said, the, the power of love, the way it, it kind of guides you down a path where, where the path of it can end in, in these kind of explosions. Cause it's so passionate and fiery mm-hmm. that and it always does in the tragedies, <clears throat> at least um, it, it kind of, do you, you, I know like Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, like when they were together, when they were like doing all those Shakespeare movies, you know, like, yeah. um, and I'm like, the reason that they were like probably really into that is one, I think because they were obviously, you know, passionately in love with each other and stuff and like wanting to do those things together where they always kind of played the opposite love interest too, yeah. so that they could like, I don't know. I mean, I think that that's definitely like a connection in that. And of course, you know, like their kind of relationship almost ended the same way, I guess, like, yeah, well, I, I think, you know, they just, the thing was, is that, I mean, they, they did have like, um, they had a passionate relationship and they, um, it, you know, it started out pretty, you know, so, cause you know, um, when Burton met Elizabeth Taylor, by the way, he was married with children. <laughs> And then he kind of went through this, like, will I, won't I thing with his wife that he was married to. And it was, like, kind of tortured the family a little bit. Um, And so it wasn't a great thing. But, yeah, I think that they were, like, kind of, I don't know. You know, you could say that they were were good for each other and then they weren't. Because uh, I don't think, you know, neither person was kind of, like, complete. You know, Richard Burton was, like, a very unhappy, like, a very melancholic person. Elizabeth Taylor, same in a way. I mean, a sickly. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I am, I am drawn to their to their story. Right. Well, I think yeah. everybody is like this kind of, and it's the same thing as Romeo and Juliet. This kind of very passionate, forbidden love. Yeah. And then that inevitably explodes. You know, like yeah. it, it can't really without. But I, I mean. <clears throat> Two for like the kind of character of Romeo, like kind of when he comes on to like the first scene that he's in, he's like kind of it's it's obviously the play is called Romeo and Juliet, but like you know we start off we don't even see him at first we see his friends kind of getting into a fight and then he kind of comes in after, uh, and it's just kind of like this kind of lovesick puppy dog, yeah. Um, like talking about his kind of sensitive young man. Um, I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, love is love is a smoke made with the fume of sighs. Yes. Yeah. Doth add more grief to too much of mine own. Uh, it's just like, 
All right, let me let me read this thing because I'm I'm going all over the place where he's talking to Benvolio, uh, uh, and he's basically like you know being like a little kind of emo boy about Rosalind not loving him anymore, and he, Benvolio says no, cause I rather weep. Romeo says, good heart at what, at thy good heart's oppression. He says, why such is love's transgression, griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast, which thou wilt propagate to have it pressed with more of thine this love that thou hast shown doth add more grief to too much of mine own and this kind of yeah being purged this this kind of he's set up right away as love is everything to this guy you know and i i think this is something that i want to connect towards kind of the emo movement and things that happened during our youth and stuff brendan and kind of the millennial youth where there is this kind of male lovesick puppy dogness and people confuse it because like you know there's like 20 25 year old like men or whatever that are just kind of what they would call fuck boys right who aren't feeling this kind of deep romantic thing but like when you're a young teenager and you're just experiencing this stuff there is that like head over heels aspect to it like there is that kind of you know, it's all, it's a cliche, but like that feeling of you would die for this person that you've never even fucking met. Like you see this beautiful woman and you fall in love with her without speaking to her or knowing anything about her Yeah, on the spot. And this always, it reminds me of mall culture too, because that was huge when we were during this time. Yeah. Yep. That's why I asked about the kind of slipknot shit and the hot topic shit, like at the, at the beginning of this, cause you're the mall expert, but yeah, I mean, what do you like? I, I'm obsessed with this idea and this feeling because I think it's there's a few people that do talk about it and mm -hmm. whenever you do you know you do have to bat down you know the usual stuff people are like oh you're gay blah 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 or like kind of from the male side but there's also this kind of I don't know like who cares or I don't know I mean well you know I I, I think um you know, he, here is um, – I, I, so, so Romeo says, um, you know, I have lost myself. I am not here. This is not Romeo. He's some other where. And I think there is a certain, you know, way of handling being like a, an adolescent, you know, because the thing is that when, when, you, when you're an adolescent man um, – male um you know i mean i think uh there's there's all kinds of factors that would make you want to escape yourself and escape your surroundings like you know like you're kind of on the verge of of being able to like be on your own and and uh and and you know maybe even traditionally you like at that age or whatever you you know when you were you know in, in times gone by you know, you might have had an opportunity to like, I don't know, work like work or something like that. And I think that um, I think that one re really good escape feeling is like that melancholy, like lovesickness. You know, it, it's a feeling that you can really chase and um, and it'll kind of like put you into this more dramatic headspace, even if it is like presents as somewhat of a sadness it's still better than some of like that boring emptiness that you feel when you're 14, 15, you know? Yeah. I think, I think it's a really, I think it's a really um, powerful way to escape. Um, and I think that some people become like addicted to that even and, and, and into their, into their adult, you know, their actual adult, you're into their manhood, you know? Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, I think that Shakespeare is capturing something of a certain male archetype, uh, because you know Romeo's here. Like Romeo, so quickly goes from um, from Rosalind to 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 Juliet, and um, and you know I think that what he's in love with here is just like he's in love with love, you know. Yeah. Because I think he starts, you know, he starts talking about. You know, he starts talking about love first, not, um, 
not this he's not talking about a, a person he's not describing a person first he's describing his feeling and i think that's kind of like he's he's trying you know he's he lo- he loves that experience and um you know i don't know i mean just also add on to the fact that he's he's in this family they're in kind of like a civil war <laughs> You know, I mean, what a what a powerful way to es- what a powerful way to escape the this his surroundings. Yeah, and I, I like the archetype as well. That, that kind of like one because I think it's an archetype that is always been prominent. But yeah, this idea of love as not as like a drug, but as like an idea that that feeling of being in love, like when you're first meeting someone. Uh, I mean, it is kind of hard to beat, I guess. It's almost euphoric, you know, like that kind of, and, and Romeo chasing that, describing Rosalind, and then, like, he, he forgets all about Rosalind the second he sees Juliet. Yeah, and, and, and I don't know, you know, good good for him, good for Romeo for, for getting involved with Juliet, because when, when he describes Rosalind, he's describing, like, kind of like, this impossible like ice queen woman he says he says um she'll not she'll not be hit with cupid's arrow she hath diane's wit and in strong proof of chastity well armed from love's weak childish bow she lives uncharmed she will not stay the siege of loving terms nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes nor ope her lap to saint seducing gold oh she is rich in beauty only poor that when she dies with beauty dies her store he's saying She's not even she's she's gonna live chaste and not have kids. Um, she hath in that sparing makes huge waste for beauty starved with her severity. So she's she's a beautiful woman, also severe. For beauty starved with her severity cuts beauty off from all posterity. She's too fair, too wise, wisely too fair, to merit bliss by making me despair. She hath forsworn to love and in that vow do I live that lived to do i live dead that lived to tell it now i mean i've known this woman by the way (laughs) Um, and there is something attractive about it but you know i don't know what what makes him yeah i mean the sting of rejection yeah from that uh yeah, it's always interesting too compared to his friends like all his friends are just kind of goofing off like kind of uh, uh, dicking around, you know, partying or whatever, and then like he's just kind of like roaming around, love sick, like looking for somebody to like fall deeply in love with next. Like he's that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing I I observed, and 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 this is something that I actually that that the insight kind of came to me in watching the Lorman version, is um especially with the Montague guys. The way it starts, uh, the way the, mo- the film basically starts with the Montagues, and it's um, Jamie Kennedy is one of them. Oh yeah, right. Jamie Kennedy is one of them, and, and one of them's Dash Mehack, and um, uh, and they're very silly, and like like they're they're, they're like really silly. They're like, cl- you know, like they're like kind of comic figures, even like Three Stooges types, you know. Yeah. Um. And they really love goofing off and being just kind of like a menace to society. And, and Romeo's seriousness of purpose is in contrast to that. And, and and I was like, these guys aren't interested in the things that Romeo's interested in. But I also think that it, it speaks to the way that so many of our of it, like I, I was a, I was like I like to be funny and make jokes, but I was also like a very serious young man i took my i took myself seriously and i took my love seriously too right and i but i think that there is like something to be said about men keeping that to them you know like like i think a lot of men like are vulnerable to to romance or to a woman or whatever to love but they just keep it to themselves and they put on this other you know they play act this other side um and you know i saw that really 
cropping up very strongly with the Montagues, particularly in the way that it's portrayed in the Lorman film. Yeah, and I what would you? I mean, I don't know. What would you call that? Like, would, would you say that that's a maturity or um, in men as they learn to not follow like the the Romeo lovesick, don't follow every path down there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me like um, I don't. No, I don't know what 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 advice would you give your son, you know? Right. What advice would you give your son? Like I I would say, hey, look, you know, I would say to my son, I would say to him, like, well, you know, Rom Romeo has an Romeo has an obsession, right. you know, he's got he's got an obsessive personality, you know, and that comes from somewhere, and I don't know if it comes from somewhere like completely healthy, you know. I think there is kind of like this healthy. I mean, Romeo is, is he, you know, is he younger than these guys? But it does seem like they're more interested in like, you know, like going around town and like fighting swords and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, like none of them mention their love interests or like anything like that when they're talking. And in fact, like when they are talking, talking, they're kind of, not discouraging him, but being like kind of almost making fun of him. Like, yeah, basically saying, Oh yeah, dude, like you're thinking with your dick actually, like you're acting like you're all romantic. Like, yeah, you just want to put it in her maiden head. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess Mercutio gets a little bit more sensitive, but he's also like the comic guy too. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And they really, um, I think the guy that plays Mercutio in the Zeffirelli one is really good. He really captures that. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I I I feel I understand the choice of of who they used in the Lurman one, but I don't. I didn't get the sense that he had that strong of a grasp of the material. Yeah. You know. Um. I mean, they really needed that guy to be like. You know, they make. <laughs> They make um, Mercutio the, like kind of a, out to be like kind of like a drag character, yeah. and in fact, and in fact, I observed, you know, Leguizamo and and Mercutio. Like, I'm just calling him Leguizamo, um, Tybalt, um, and Mercutio. You know, like I did kind of see like, like that there almost there was almost like this kind of like uh, erotic tension that was being played up in in the Lorman piece. Um, Lerman makes yeah. some strange decisions. Yeah, <clears throat> with uh, one I think is Mercutio's death in that one. I thought he made kind of a, at least when it was happening, compared to the Zeffirelli version, like because he has that that kind of monologue he's going on and and kind of he's joking, but also he's dying, right that that Zeffirelli kind of captured pretty well that actor and then like in the Lerman version I was thinking like uh I don't know if they're quite I don't know strange decision there's another one where another one too that I think Lerman dropped the ball on for a uh, iconic kind of scenes but yeah under love yeah. under love's heavy burden do I sink like that line alone like Romeo under love's heavy burden do I sink? And I like the description of that. Love's heavy burden. What, what do you think of that? Like, Or just like the burden of love in general? Because... I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, <clears throat> is, he de you know, is he destined to, I mean, is this just kind of like, is he just like acting out? It, it seems to me to be more about like, I don't know his 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 fate as a as a person, you know, and that like his psychological trait to be so, um, to be so obsessed with this thing. I think, um, you know, it, that that's obviously like his obsession is his fate, you know, and uh, and I think that that, that that that's true for some people, like that that they're that they're given they're given a burden in life with with some kind of like psychological obsession or 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 even a gift you know 
and that that gift ultimately is their destiny and it's not always a good one you know and it's not always a good one you know or just um, like the vulnerability of it yes the kind of because it is kind of <clears throat> a, a heavy feeling like yeah when you are in that stage of love and this is love at first sight too which is the most romantic version of this yeah. like <clears throat> it's it's it is kind of a heavy feeling in your chest and then to be carrying that around and he kind of describes himself sinking under it too almost yeah. like you're drowning in it or or you know, yeah, obviously, if we foreshadow the death, you're, you're drowning in this love, you know, you're, despite it feeling good, you're still, you can easily slip under the current, you know, and be pulled under. Yeah, well, I, I wonder if, I mean, and, and, and to me, I, I kind of like, you know, they're trying to get, you know, with, with that, they're, you know, they're trying to get Romeo to like, participate in their reverie right you know and um and he's saying you know like uh that he has a soul of lead and and to me it's almost like he's saying like you know like i'm i'm burdened with like melon like basically i you know like i'm a depressed person i have a, a depressive personality and you know i'm just i'm not like you and romeo is very much like like i'm not like other guys you know oh, he's yeah. like i'm other guys you know and i think i think there is a uh um there, that's part of this kind of type of personality and being so like like, like oh i'm so you know like I, I i love so deeply and am so romantic and it's like i'm not like i'm not like other men it's like trying to it's trying to separate yourself from from other people, I, uh, I wonder. People do that? Do you do you think that that's real? That there are men that feel the burden of love more than others. That there is a difference between those kind uh, of hopeless romantic Romeos and your average kind of dick jokes in the town square pulling out swords. Well, I think um, I think maybe it's it's possible that maybe there's a certain there's a certain aspect to it that 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 you know young you know like young boys at a certain like they're not as comfortable around like with their with their peers and with being a being male like I'm not saying like that they're tra- like I'm not making. <laughs> Like I'm not saying like there's there's I'm not trying to do like like queer theory here at all, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just saying yeah. that I think like, um, there are certain boys that are like uncomfortable with masculinity. Maybe they have a maybe with the maybe they have a father. They don't want to be like you know or something like that. Or maybe so just they, they love harder than others. And yeah, you were I mean, saying kind of like personality. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking but of I'm, it, yeah, like. But I'm, but but my point, Andrew, would be that it, that it, it it comes from somewhere, you know, that it comes from somewhere, and you know, I don't know if it has to do with, you know, I do, I I tend to think it has to do with like early, um, like early family dynamics or something like that, you know, like I was really, um, I I, I was interested in in separating myself from my male peers. You know, and I've always been drawn to women and and romance, and obsessive romance. You know, yeah. And um, <clears throat> you know, and, and I'm and I do think that there are just and so I guess to answer your question, right? Yes, there are there are men that that are more inclined that way than others. It's not it's not an act. And, you know, my, my question would just be like, well, where does it come from? You know, um, but that, that kind of emo, emo, sad boy. Yeah. Where does that come from? Uh, yeah. You that's, know? that's, yeah. I don't have no idea, but I mean, 
I do. <clears throat> I'm only asking this, and yeah, I don't, I'm not, you know, thinking we're going to get any definitive answers. But it just like I am fascinated by this idea of am I the only one that's feeling this, you know, out of like whatever your little group of friends or whatever, you know, when you're that age kind of, don't you understand, you know, kind of like there, there was always that kind of element to what I would get out of something, even something, let's not even say like love or relationship, like a work of art or something. Like I, I'm more of, I tend to romanticize things. I tend to romanticize relationships and, you know, uh, romanticize a love story or something. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe there is just something like you said, maybe it's some type of either genetic or maybe some type of upbringing thing that's instilled in you toward this more kind of sensitive proclivities, like these kind of a heightened sense of, of, I don't know, those sorts of feelings or, I mean, you know, well, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I certainly don't want to discount that, that there are people who are on different wavelengths, you know, um, and have different intelligences and things like that. You know, I, I wonder though, it's like, it's like this, you know, like being a romantic, I think is like, you know, like kind of like wanting to invest um, you know, g give give some drama and some gravitas to whatever it is that you're, you know, like to to your life and to life in general. And I think that for some people, like they're they're very like, gra you know, like there's some very grounded people I think who are very like comfortable and um, you know, like just kind of day to day life, or in their you know, and like whatever the their path it's kind of enough for them on an emotional level you know and i think there's some people who do have like a little bit more need to get you know like to to seek a higher emotional register outside of themselves you know and i see that with romeo for sure yeah i see him like trying to like and this and this is the beauty of shakespeare where it's like so much of what so much of it i feel that i get out of shakespeare and it's and that's why I love the Tempest. Um, I would say that's my favorite play. It's like his question is kind of like, well, where does where does drama come from? You know, where does drama come from? And 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 I think, you know, the answer is kind of like, well, it comes from the it comes from the dramatist. And in this case, Romeo is kind of like the dramatist of of his world. You know, and 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 that proves to be kind of in both his romanticizing his surroundings and his experience and the experience of others. Um, but also in so doing and making this and, 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 and putting all this into motion, real drama comes from it, you know, a conflict, um, uh, a, uh, a love story, but also, you know, some tragedy and, and it's all kind of, he's, he's, he's engineering it from his very heart, you know, he's like making it all happen from his very heart. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what I'm saying, you know, I don't know what that means exactly, but I do feel like that is a common, I find that to be kind of a common theme of, um, when I read Shakespeare, you know, and, and I'm seeing that with Romeo, you know, like he's the author, he's the author of these events by being so sensitive, you know, and he's engineering them just purely from his artistic, I guess you just call it kind of his artistic temperament. Yeah, that's what I'm, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at too, is that, yeah, like what makes an artistic, temp what separates the kind of, and I mean, you know, I, I don't know, but I'm just like, yeah, like these, the sensitive young man who's more inclined to do that. I wonder if you say like it is like a way to rationalize or dramatize something that is, you know, everyday occurring type thing, you know, like it, it is kind of like a way to do that. But then like what stops other people from doing, you know, like what, why is it because of women? Like, like, like this is another one where I don't think we're going to have a definitive answer, but I want your thoughts on this, man. Like, let's kind of like, is it because of women that 
a sensitive young man would be more drawn to the kind of what some would call the more feminine side of the spectrum. Like, yeah. Is it to get laid or and then like, as opposed to kind of the more masculine side of the spectrum where, you know, you're kind of winning a conquest or like, you know, stabbing somebody with a sword to impress a girl. You're like trying yeah. to read Shakespeare, you know, to impress a girl or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to, I, I, I certainly, the thing is that my, my intention is not to like disparage, um, anybody at all. Oh no! But I yeah. do feel like, but I do feel like the artistic temperament comes from. It could certainly come from somebody look, looking out at the world, really young and vulnerable eyes, you know, yeah. and being like, I can't. Yeah. Okay, I can't compete on this level. Like, I'm not going to be this type. Like, I'm not going to be able to be that type of person and be sexually successful romantically successful or just even successful like i'm not gonna yeah like i'm not gonna be a soccer player (laughs) and and, and so then it's like well what other options do i have you know and maybe it's to be a you know and, and thank god it's to be a creative person it's to be somebody who's actually i'm actually gonna get to know because because then over time, you know, like I do feel like the artistic temperament in men is closer to women. Yeah. Like they mm-hmm. might not have like this like lay, you know, like like 4D chess understanding of the female psychology, but they're just closer to the feminine and the things that uh, women do and are drawn to naturally. And that becomes useful. You know, it also becomes useful. And that's, you know, and I mean, I, the thing is, is that ultimately I, I don't think that it so much matters, like, you know, whether whether it comes from that or if it's like a gift from God. And I mean, there's a question, I think, in my opinion, also, like, well, where do where do gifts from God come from? And like, how are they actually, um, how, you know, how does God actually make those things happen? You know, it's 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 less interesting to me to think, oh, I was born with it than to think I was put on this earth and then through the course of events, this is how I developed this gift or this, you know, we're calling it. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard a temperament and i think that's a good word for it you know and like um i think that you know that that's one way of looking at and saying like well god really kind of has his own style um but i think yeah i mean i think you know who knows like shakespeare you know one was ultimately like he was an entertainer you know and and i don't know what his um romantic life was like at all but you know it's probably pretty decent (laughs) yeah dude and like if you can make you know and i mean there's there's all kinds of different strategies that that there's all kinds of different strategies that men develop um to be i think to be successful with women i think it's it's kind of undeniable that men are more obsessed with women than women are with men what do you think about that Uh, what do you think about a hundred percent yes you're i think that's a hundred percent the case and i wonder if that is biologically ingrained, like there is, that's what I mean, because all men have this kind of thing, but then like, you you know, it's more pronounced, like you said, more of a temperament, more prominent temperament, and some men other than others, kind of the romantic, sad emo boys, right, the art school boys, the, uh, you know, 
Yeah, everybody knows who we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you no. Know? What? Like, like, like people who who to make a choice or 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 naturally get gravitate towards like being funny. You know, like when I think about like a Chris Farley or whatever. Oh, yeah. You know? Like, you know, kind of a fat like like a fat kid. You know, and it's like, how am I gonna? In, in, in fact, it's really just like it's not even just a question about like how am I going to attract women it's like how am i gonna make my how am i gonna be how am i gonna make my way through this world as a man like right. what am i gonna do how am i gonna do it like you know i'm i'm kind of you know like i'm kind of sensitive i'm kind of afraid of conflict and you know i'm small or whatever so i gotta do this or you know like i'm a fat kid and like uh so what am i gonna do oh i know what i'll do i'll be funny right. i'll make everyone laugh right. and i'll be and i'll kind of like become valuable that way and um i do think that men are incomplete and women are complete <laughs> you know that's kind of how i look at it. yeah they're born complete you know they have everything they need um and and they have everything they need and 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 that's enough for them to to be taken care of essentially and then for a man the it's a little bit tougher. It's like, and, and don't get me wrong. Like women are very vulnerable. Women are very vulnerable, you know, and, and in a way that men are not, but, um, but a man has to kind of be like, well, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to make my way through this world? How am I going to be valuable? How am I going to prove myself? And, and I do think that, um, that I think that, that some men take a look at their, like, inherent resources and some of the things that maybe they're attracted to and, and where that comes from, I don't know. And they say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to make my way through this world. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, in Romeo, he's kind of surrounded by um, violence and violent men and he chooses love and peace and he becomes almost, you know, in, 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 in the friar, I think kind of sees in him an instrument of peace yeah, but what ends up happening is unfortunate, very unfortunate. Yeah, and there's even that line I think when he's he's talking to somebody, right? He's like, "Peace, cousin, peace." Yeah. Uh, uh, Romeo is almost like the peacemaker, and even Mercutio's death, he's like the one that's trying to break it up and then causes the death, etc. But yeah, I do want to touch on the first time he sees uh, uh, Juliet because. This is one of the most romantic parts. I think this in the you know in the balcony scene, and the kind of is the kind of that is you know the bread and butter of the hopeless romantic emo boy you know, mm -hmm. uh, where he's this is uh, as, Act One, Scene Five, kind of they're at the party. He sees Juliet, <clears throat> and he turns to a serving man. He said, "What ladies that what ladies that which doth enrich the hand of younger of yonder knight." And the serving man says, I know not, sir. And then Romeo says, Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night as a rich jewel in an Ethiopian's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. And I mean, it goes on, so shows a snowy dove trooping with crows as yonder lady o'er her fellow shows. The measure done, I'll watch her place of stand and touching hers make blessed my rude hand. Did my heart till now, I forswear it, sight. For I never saw true beauty till this night. And that's like the big thing. That's like his first seeing Juliet. Yes. And just kind of that longing that strikes him automatically. And obviously it's for the beauty, right? Like the physical beauty at first. Yeah. Uh, but then he immediately kind of falls for her in this way. It's just kind of so romantic it's so romantic i couldn't help but kind of be charmed by it when i was reading through here and like pull it out <laughs> to be like all right brendan like yeah this is romantic boy shit right here like this oh, tendency absolutely. to just go directly into this oh my god she makes the torches burn bright right or or she teach the torches to burn bright she's brighter than they are yeah 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 that's amazing um well, um, you know, I think what I see in, in this is like, you know, so Romeo sees the world um, 
I, I mean, I his his ability to articulate this and 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 to be able to see it in this kind of like psychedelic way, you know, that's that's kind of like how the how that's kind of like what the beauty of like the poet is or the artist is is that like you can see the world in this really intense way and see like you can see a woman as a rich jewel you know you don't just see her as a woman you know um and to be able to put it in those terms that's pretty amazing um yeah yeah i would say that uh that's what i kind of got out of that and uh you know and, and i don't know what um and he's able to like use this ability to um to artic you know like the sensitivity he's able to like speak to juliet in this way you know take her hand and speak to her in this um you know really powerful and like i don't i want to say it, not flowery but you know just like descriptive way oh yeah and he's into him you know right away too that too, because we talked a lot so far about the male perspective, but I think Juliet kind of gives the female love kind of hopeless romantic perspective too, you know? Like there is, like Juliet's kind of when she's, after they touch hands and whatever, they speak for the first time, <clears throat> and she's telling the nurse to like, go ask his name, uh, if he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. Yeah, she's uh, she's connected to like, she's she Juliet's very connected to like this idea of like love, like love unto death, you know? Yeah. Love and hate. Yeah. Yeah. The extremes. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. That too. yeah. She says, yeah, she's my love. My only look when she, the nurse returns and says, his name is Romeo and a Montague, the only son of your great enemy, Juliet, you know, to herself. Cause Shakespeare famously had these kind of solo little monologues or soliloquies to the audience. My only love sprung from my only hate, too early seen unknown and known too late. Prodigious, pff, prodigious birth of love it is to me that I must love a loathed enemy. Yes. And, you know, but that's, I, I feel like that's very, um, you know, like teenage girls are very, it can be very extreme, I think, you know. Oh, yeah. And, 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 uh, and so that's, you know, that's part of it. I, I don't know. You know, that's that's funny, Andrew. I mean, like, very much this time around, I was very conscious of the fact that they were just like young kids, like young people experiencing this really powerful drug, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when that that I think evolutionarily makes sense, you know, like I think classically you know, we, we, we experience love most intensely when we're in, when we're teenagers. And that's kind of like, I think historically prior to, um, modern society, when people would just basically like start figuring out who the hell they were going to marry and have kids with, you know? Yeah. Um, were you, were you an intense relationship guy in those well, youth, the teenage okay. years? Okay. So that's a great question, Andrew. And, and I'll, I'll explain. I um, was, when I was, like, around age 15, um, I had my first girlfriend. She was she was a couple years older than I was. She was a senior, and I was a sophomore in high school. And um, and I kind of needed that. I kind of needed, like, like, this more, this older girl with confidence to, like, come on to me because I just, like, didn't know how to make it happen for myself in a way. And once that happened, I was like really, really in love with this girl that I was dating at the time uh, that it lasted for like, honestly, Andrew, like four weeks, probably. And, <laughs> and, and it was like an absolute cringe fest on my part from start to finish. You know, like I got I was really intense. I was really into her. I didn't I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And, and she backed off like very quickly and almost immediately because it was, I was just too intense and once that happened you know I was kind of broken up about it um you know I talked to my dad about it and I was like dad you know like you know like you know it's, it's hard for me to let go like I, I think I even said like it's hard for me to let go you know of what we had and my dad was like my dad was like well what he was like well what did you have 
and and basically in, he instructed me. In fact, and I took it more as a command um, to quote. This is a quote now: "Play the field." <laughs> And, and that I did and that I, I really did not become a super in, I was not like a super intense relationship guy in high school. I was very much like, you know, play, I guess you could say play in the field, you know, but then when I was 18, I dated this girl. She was a little bit younger than I was problematic. I know, you know, forgive me. I didn't. <laughs> know that. And, um, and, and you know, I was going to go away to college and she was not. And I kind of had that sense of like, we're doomed, you know, and it really, really, Andrew affected me greatly. It deeply affected me. I was very, very upset and very existential about it, you know? And, um, yeah. Um, and so I think I was capable, I was capable of some really deep feeling for, for, people and, and, and thinking about it a lot and being obsessed with it. My dad briefly, you know, my dad was able to intervene during the, and, and, and keep me away from that during like the meat of my high school years, which is probably for the better. Um, because, you know, I, I was able to focus on other things. I, I was a musician. And so I really kind of like was able to focus on that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think naturally I was very, very, I was very romantic and very deep into whoever I was into for whatever the, re you know, for whatever the reason. Oh yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. What about you? I'd, I'd be interested here. Well, for me, <clears throat> I got into a relationship kind of like eighth grade. Nice. Where I was dating this girl and you know, it was middle school relationship. Uh, but, yeah. but also like we were together pretty much all of high school. So we were wow. together for a while, uh, like through high school and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, till the high school? Till, um, when? Till the end of high school? Like, did you Basically, graduate? yeah. Wow. Wow, well, that's all, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I mean, it was always kind of, it was always, I mean, yeah, it was definitely like passionate, but it was also, you know, young. Mm -hmm. But I think it definitely, like, I, I've always kind of been a relationship type of guy. Like, that yeah. I'm more comfortable with that. Mm-hmm than I am with any, I mean, you know, there were times in my life, you know, where I was not doing, you know, the relationship guy thing, but it was also like, I don't know. It just always felt, I like that more. I like, you know, I'm the type of person that I don't like surface level, you know, fine. I'll do small talk with a stranger or something, but I like to get to it like kind of, okay, you know, we can talk about the weather and all that kind of shit. But like, what I want to talk about is, yeah, this type of shit. Like, I like deep connections. Like, I, I'm, I get a lot of meaning out of that. And not just, you know, romantic either, but, you know, with friends and all of that, kind of the friend level and stuff like that. I like intimate relationships. Uh Sure. It, it's just always been something that I, I like those more than I like any type of surface level kind of relationship. And, and I don't know, I've just always been prone to this idea of, you know, yeah, like, uh, it's going to sound stupid, but like, yeah, I'm not quite like other guys. Yeah, like I'm not. Nice. And, and it's not even like I tried to do that or anything, or that was like a big part of my who I was, you know, to tell myself that, you know, like, oh, I'm not like them, you know. It was just something that would be constantly be shoved in my face over and over again, kind of like, yeah, like we'd all go see a movie together, you know, boy, your boys, whatever, high school, middle school, even college, you know, whatever, even now, you know. And I would just get something out of it, like, completely different than they would, you know. Like, it would just be, I mean, I'd still notice what they noticed, you know, like, oh, the girl's tits or whatever, of course, like, <laughs> you know, I'm still very yeah, yeah. much into tits, but like, I would get, I'm like, yeah, but like, 
he died for her or you know like did you not like they like, can yeah. feel those prickles on your arms when that scene was happening and most of them didn't no they didn't feel those prickles on their arms when that scene was happening so that i mean that's why i asked you earlier just because i've something i always think about or just kind of and i will say you know no not like that like not that like I've never dated anyone that was like obsessed with me or something after a breakup or anything like that. But like, yeah, you know, I'm not quite like <laughs> anybody else. Like you're going to meet in that, at least in terms of that, like relationships or my romantic disposition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always entirely true either. Cause you know, I've, I've come across people, especially in the internet age where everybody can, you can be connected to strangers on the internet, even, you know, yeah and have connections, uh, things in common and stuff. And so I, there's other people like me, I think with that kind of dis disposition, but I, I, that's why I'm just curious about it. Like, I think there is that kind of, I don't know if I'm just more sensitive to it or what it was or yeah, what caused me to be this way or see a different way. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I don't know, you know, I I, uh, I think when it comes to that kind of thing, um, I was I was very much obsessed with um, romantic longing from an early age, from a very early age, very early age, you know. Yeah. And I think I used it in um, the Romeo sense too, right? Like kind yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, and so. You know, but I, I and and I don't know necessarily where it came from. I all you know, but I was not, but I was also not someone who, um, you know, I I didn't I, to me it was more of a of a thing like a private thing, you know, that I was like that I would experience this like longing kind of from a distance, you know, and um, and Romeo is experiencing that at the beginning of the play. Um, but then he actually, you know, then he actually kind of acts on it um, and just kind of goes after what he wants, you know, and earlier on, um, I wasn't, I wasn't really like that per se. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I would spend a lot of time like from, from, and like from a very early age, like maybe like, you know, third grade or fourth grade or maybe yeah. even early and that now that I think about it um like kind of like privately uh obsessing over that kind of thing you know and then telling my friends about it you know did and, you, and, yeah did you ever ask, like I remember in fifth grade I gave for Valentine's Day I gave this girl that I had a crush on a box of chocolates like in school like Hell yeah. in school and of course she didn't like me you know like Oh, I so see. it was like a big like it was a formative moment for me in my youth for sure and I yeah. was of course embarrassed when I was rejected yeah she did accept it but it was also like uh <laughs> in my youth yeah like when you when you when you're doing that to what the kind of yeah she was not into me right uh so yeah. it was an embarrassing moment for sure when I was a little like nine, ten year old. Yes, being like I'm Romeo and in love with this uh, this woman uh, or this young girl at the time when I was a young man. Yeah. Okay. Now that you mention it, when I was in when I was in fourth grade, right? There like, was a you would do like they would make you make those little valentine bags in school and shit you know yeah and you'd give each other valentines i took a lot of pride in that <laughs> you know like and i would give special ones to the girls i liked you know oh yeah well you know i don't know um he here's just one memory i have fourth grade so this would have been like um 19 like 96 maybe and i like i had the internet at my house like for early and um, I printed off like an entire like lyric book of like Nirvana lyrics and like stapled it together and then gave it to this girl that I liked because I knew yes. that she knew who Nirvana was. 
And she was, like, very public about, like, it being weird and not being into me. But then she would also talk to me on the phone outside of school. And that was my first experience of, like, kind of like a girl playing on my phone a little bit, you know, and, like, accepting my attention but not um, agreeing to be my girlfriend. Were you a mixtape guy? Were you handing out mixed CDs, burned CDs in middle school and stuff? I did that. And same thing with lyrics. She said printed lyrics. I gave a girl yeah. in like sixth grade like a, a CD I burned for her with like printed out lyrics to accompany that. Like, nice. <laughs> like yeah, stapled together like that. Those yeah. romantic boys, dude. That's what I mean. Like, were you the only boy doing that? And you're seemingly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it was I. Like... <laughs> I, I okay. Okay, so I will say this. I was the most romantic boy in school yes. for the time. Yes. For the longest time. For me, it oh. was always. <laughs> like, always in almost every situation, I would find myself being like, you guys don't, you know, nobody else is uh, all right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, part of it was that, like, maybe they had, like, an inherent understanding that, like, you know, um. I don't know, Andrew. I mean, you know, do women like that kind of thing or do they like being like teased and like kind of, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. I didn't know, I didn't understand that. Like you had to kind of be a little, a little be a little like playful and mean maybe. And that would have been better. I wasn't like that at all. I didn't, I wouldn't have liked, you know, like it wouldn't have been something that I would have been really drawn to doing really. Well, it depends too. I think at that age, I think they definitely liked the attention and they definitely liked the gesture. When you were a musician, you know, you write a song for a girl or play it to her or like, you know, even if you're just hanging out at a house party or something, you start like performing whatever. I think they like that. But I think there's also different, you know, times in your life as well. So when somebody in middle school, they probably just are flattered by the attention, even if they're not attracted to you or anything. Yeah, they like that. But I remember, what was that that dumb Gerard Butler movie or something, the, the, the Ugly Truth? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a rom-com like in the early oh. 2000s where he plays this kind of raunchy radio host guy that like, you know, helps men like fuck women, like kind of, and he falls in love with this little feminist girl and that's the, that's the you know, plot. Uh, Catherine Heigl, I think, plays the feminist girl who was smoking hot, you know, especially in that movie. She was like her peak of her career. Uh, she was like just coming off Grey's Anatomy or something, I think. And it, it anyway, it was like there's a scene in that where he's talking to his little nephew who's like 13, and he's like obsessed with this girl. And his nephew's like, "But you told me to be mean to girls." And he's like, "No." He's like, "I told you to be mean to 25 year old girls who think they're the hottest thing on earth." He's like, "Don't be <laughs> mean to the 13 year old girl you're trying to ask out to the dance." Like, <laughs> you know, like. And I think there's some truth to that. So like when they, in the 25, when you're an adult, especially if yeah. you're going for somebody out of your league or something, which I encourage everybody to do, go for it, right? Why not? But uh, just like there's a different time for different measures in terms of like the rom romantic kind of how you would get laid as an adult is not what you were doing when, you know, when you're like in middle school and stuff, like making mixed burning CDs for your crush and being like, this is about us. Like, you know, this is about us. This yeah. is our song. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, is cause I, so like fourth grade, you know, I was like, I was putting the moves on this girl, you know, um, she might've been out of my league. Maybe not, you know, I don't know. But then in fifth grade, um, I had a little bit of an issue, um, like with some other kids in school, kind of, I guess you would use the word bullying me and it kind of fucked me up and made me feel like I was actually like a huge nerd, you know? And that affected my self-confidence from like fifth grade until I was in high school. And then when I was in high school, I was very fortunate, Andrew to go to an arts and human, like to an, like to an art, small arts high school. And by that point, and once I had my first girlfriend when I was 15 and she was older, like my confidence just kind of like went through the roof. Right. I wasn't afraid to like, 
I, I felt like, oh, I can put the moves on any girl and, and she'll go for it. And that's kind of how it went for me. Um, but um, I, uh, I wish that I wish that I'd had a little bit. I wish that I'd been a little bit more um, aggressive when I was like a middle school, you know, just just for my own. You know, like it would have been it would have made it a better experience than it was, you know, like I, it was like um my my experience in middle school was mostly like was basically like being like it would it was like being on like the come town podcast like 24 <laughs> oh yeah it's like yeah <clears throat> jackass era and uh yeah yeah oh yeah. jackass era yes exactly and yeah ball taps and sure sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah um what yeah, what's your favorite? What's your favorite rom com? Ooh, um, I have a couple, and I have a couple that make me very teary eyed. You know, like yeah, sure. The Notebook is one, that's for sure. Um, I like oh. what? Oh, interesting. I, I have not, not. I don't think I've. I've not seen the Notebook, but I've, I've heard people describe it to me. And you know the memes and all that. Yeah, it, it, dude. It's people clown on it, but it is such a love story, and it's all. It's in the vein of Romeo and Juliet. In that, you know, as every love story that's come after this has been. And really, when I was in grad school, I took a great course called Shakespeare Sources, where we we're talking about the source material, the, the stories that came before Shakespeare's stories, you know, oh, that's where he had some, you know, there were definitely stories like this that Shakespeare was taking from, you know, and, and making yeah. them better. Like when you read them back to back, Shakespeare's were just better than the other ones. That's why he's remembered yeah. and they aren't. Yeah, because his were just from better. But um, yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of kind of, I don't know. I mean... Yeah, yeah. Have you seen? Have you ever seen You've Got Mail? Uh, yeah, I have, but a long time ago when it came out with Tom Hanks, and um, it's very much like when Harry met Sally a little bit, right? Well, well, it's um, you know, it's like it's about these people who are like enemies in like basically like business rivals in a sense in real life. Like Tom Hanks is like a. He owns like Bar- he's like he's like the CEO of like a Barnes and Noble style corporate <laughs> bookstore, and Meg Ryan is the owner of like a local bookstore. You know, and they start and, chatting right online, and but, yeah, but they don't know that it's yeah, them. yeah. They start, but they're also both in relationships at the time, which you know I don't know how I feel about that. But then again, they weren't they're not married, but they they are kind of like emotionally cheating on their partners online. You know. And then, you know, they kind of find out over the course of the movie, you know, that it's that, you know, that they're that because they also are, even though they're they're ri- rivals and enemies in real life, um, they also start to fall for each other in real life as well. Right. And so by the time that they are, you know, the rubber is going to meet the road and they're going to meet each other from the internet, <laughs> meet each other from the internet, they're kind of hoping that it's going to be them and it's a it's a sweet story you know Dude, it's a sweet i love those types of things and i like i like it i get immense pleasure out of being moved to tears by a love yeah. story i mean so, any story any tragedy but love stories in particular that chill that comes over you when you're witnessing something that's well done and you're like you know whether it be in the play like this if you had a great cast doing it perfectly and then if, you know, in a movie or something like that, like I said, the notebook, there's certain scenes. It's a wonderful life. Like, oh God. like there, there are scenes in that where I am just, and it's every single time I watch it, I cannot, I, I cannot not, like, I can't not cry watching it. And it's like, I don't know why that is. I mean, I do know why it is. It's because I'm overwhelmed by like what's being portrayed in front of me, you know? Yeah. And I just... Yeah. And it's always those very passionate scenes that uh, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I mean, yeah, It's a Wonderful Life's the great example of it where I think, 
you know, Jimmy Stewart in that movie is, is fight. He's trying to fight his romantic sensibilities. That's part of the plot, at least in the beginning, right? Where he's trying to go be an adventurer. He's trying to go leave town and go on an adventure, right? And be his own man. And he keeps getting sucked back in. And that, that scene when they're, when his buddy's calling him and telling him to invest in the plastics, like factory, and they're getting yes. closer and closer together on screen. And they're like, and they're like all each have the phone. They're like both listening into the phone. So they're getting closer and closer to one another. And, yeah. you know, he's like, you tell him that's a chance of a lifetime. And she kind of looks at him and is like, he says it's the chance of a lifetime. And they just drop the phone and he grabs her. He's like, now you <laughs> listen to me. You understand? He's like, I don't want any plastics and I don't want any ground floors. And I'm leaving tomorrow. You understand? I'm never getting married ever. And then they just start like kissing each other. Like even yeah. just thinking about it now, like I get that kind of chill like over me, like the kind of like goose pimples yeah. come through. And I don't know why I've just always been attuned to a scene like that, to to a passionate exchange like that, to feelings like that, whether in art or real life or anything like it, you know, like there's just immense I don't know. I don't know why, man. I don't know why, but I've just always been more sensitive to it than almost anyone I've met. And it's not like I've met everybody in the world, listeners. So it's not like I'm trying to say, oh, I'm this special little boy. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, it's just. Uh... Well, it's yeah, it's good to be in touch with feelings like that. I um, I'm I'm moved by um, I don't know um. You know, like, I don't know, sport, sports movies move me yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Yes. They yes. move me quite a bit. Rudy? And, uh, what's that? Rudy? Yeah, Rudy, exactly. Something Remember like the that. Titans was big when we were kids? Yeah, yeah. That's um, not as much as, like, a tragic, but there's some, yeah. But Rudy, kind of the death. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, even, but also the, tri- but also, like, the triumph of, like, the underdog is always, like. yeah really kind of moves me um you know um speaking of it's a wonderful life i had uh frank capra frank capra's biographer on my show right i saw Um, that yeah right and um yeah he told an he he had an interesting story about writing frank capra's biography but you know um yeah anyway i don't want to get into it but uh but apparently like you know frank capra was um you know, like they kind of thought of him as like this, like kind of populist, everyman filmmaker, but he was actually like a very um, like conservative capitalist man who also um, was an informant during uh, during the Red Scare, like like was like ratting out people oh, for being communist. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but that doesn't. Ch- I mean, I don't say that to say because it's a wonderful life. Like, I honestly, Andrew, this is you're going to think this is um, kind of weird, but. I hadn't seen It's a Wonderful Life until this last Christmas. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was like a very amazing and moving experience. Um, and I love, and I just thought it was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. What do you want, Mary? You want the moon? <laughs> say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it. Pull it down. You do a uh, pretty good Stewart. Dude, I've seen almost every Jimmy Stewart movie. I loved Stewart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were talking. Yeah, well, that's right. We were talking about. Um, the Man Who Shot Liberty <laughs> Valance. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's another one. I mean, not it doesn't have anything to do with this one, but I mean, the overall theme of that kind of, it's not as moving kind of passionately. Like, it, you know, I wouldn't be moved to tears of that movie, but just the overall theme, right? When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Yeah. The story, the romance around it is what matters more than the fact, the truth, whatever it is. People, are, oh, what is true? Fuck what is true. What feels true? <laughs> what do you know is absolutely real as you're feeling it inside of you? You know, that kind of, uh oh yeah dude love Stuart. love it i think yeah. people clown on him too because he did kind of become a caricature towards the end but he was just so famous you know like but yeah dude i did there's so many lines in that it's a wonderful life dude that are some of the most romantic kind of love stuff even just the way Stuart would play like a desperate man i think was yeah. just so good uh uh, that you know another scene that always gets me and it's a wonderful life dude when they when he loses everything right after yeah. the 
right after and Potter finds that money and he goes to Potter, the man he can't stand, who hates him, and he's begging him for money, like a loan, because he lost that money. Sure. And and he comes back to the house, right? And he blows up on the family, like in that kind of but right before he blows up and like not turns over the table, like that scene when he walks in and his daughter's playing the piano and his son comes up to him who's like three years old or whatever, like and he kind of has this tinsel, like hands full of tinsel because they're decorating the tree. And he just comes up to him and Jimmy Stewart just grabs him and just like holds him, just like squeezes him like as hard as he can. And just like kissing his head and like starting to cry. And the kid has no idea why, you know, the kid's trying to put tinsel on his head because he doesn't understand it. And it's just like things like that would just like get me very choked up like uh, as soon as I see it. Or even at the end, like when everybody's dumping that money on the table, like even that, like my brother George, the richest man in the world, like kind of that, uh, I feel it. Like I said, the goose pimples, yeah. dude, like the kind Perfect. of, just thinking about it gets me that kind of, I don't know. I've just always been just like an emotional, sensitive person, dude, like just a sensitive young man, uh, huh. n- not so young anymore, but <laughs> Well, um, yeah, well, I mean, just the fact that it's like about, I don't know. There's the, the thing that moved me is that it was like this guy didn't understand his place in the world. Like he didn't right. understand his role in God's universe, you know. And 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 it, his his life didn't turn out the way that he wanted it to turn out, you know. Like his will, but then you know, an angel is sent to save his life. And show him, by the way, like, you know, this is God, you know, like, you know, you're, you, you're an instrument of God's will, you know, and like his understanding of his place in the world was changed and his will to live was restored and it saved his life. And that's, you know, I think if anybody's ever gone through like a dark time in their life or, you know, God, I mean, that how, how beautiful would that be to reframe like. To, to have a new understanding of like who you are and what your role is in, in the world, you know, like, because we want to believe that we have a role, I think in, in, in the world, I guess I would say, you know, and yeah, that, that's, that's what moved me. I think the other, you know, people shit on that movie too. One, because it's so popular and two, just because it's so good. I think people try to, you know, denigrate it. But another reason right. I think they do is because it's very masculine and what I mean by that is that, you know, the kind of most men live lives of quiet desperation type idea yes. where he wanted something else and he never got it. And it like, you know, and it is just this thing that like, but he got something else, you know, and he didn't quite realize that. But I still think that there's this, it's this internal struggle within every kind of man more specifically but i'm not saying this doesn't happen for women or anybody else you know but it it just specifically men that are just kind of you know you you want something and then you you don't get it and you're failing and then you kind of uh lose track of everything else you know maybe it's a passion thing maybe it's a because even George in that movie, he wants this romantic, adventurous life, like seeing the world, uh, becoming some big architect, you know, like doing something <clears throat> with his life. And he feels like he got that taken from him or, I don't know, duty called or he he had to watch his brother get these kind of, he didn't get to be a war hero. He didn't get to travel. He didn't even get to serve because of his fucking ear that got hurt when he saved his brother when he was a kid, you know, like, I don't know. There's just something desperate in a lot of men. Mm -hmm. And I think that that movie really captures that. And then it, it kind of, it actually even gives you a happy ending with that, like gives you a satisfaction and shows you that actually you should be grateful kind of, you know, message or whatever look around you and look at all this greatness around you that you've helped create. <clears throat> and yeah. I think people don't like that maybe because it is so masculine. 
I don't well, know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but well, I, you know, I, I do, I do think that, um, you know, people have a hard time um, appreciating their lives as as they are. Like yeah. that, that's an inherent difficulty of life, and that it actually takes like some practice and work. Um, and and it's an important thing to folk. I think it's like so important to focus on what you what you have and instead of what you don't have. And it's like such a simple message. And I, I think that a lot of people, like they don't even want to believe that that's true. They don't even want to believe that it's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, ha- have you ever seen a uh, rear window? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. What about vertigo? Oh yeah. Jimmy Stewart. Okay. I love rear that- window too. As I, I saw it when I was a kid and it was like one of my favorites. Nice. Nice, I, yeah. I, just the voyeurism, the spying, the, mm-hmm. the, I still love that. I just moved recently, but like, I lived in an apartment for many years before this. And what I would always do is I'd always pay attention to, I wasn't like just like staring out the window looking for shit, but I'd always be paying attention to what was happening like out in like the, all these people living in this building, you know? Yeah. And what was going on with it. And I think that's romantic too, like a romantic sense of, of the world kind of voyeuristically observing it and these different things like the divorced mom that lived down the hall, like when her boyfriend would come pick her up, like, Cause I'd hear his fucking car, you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, like, and I'd be like, Oh yeah. And you start to just like these little stories, this little kind of rear window, you start to construct these things. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. I love yeah. That. At the last apartment that I lived at, um, there was this guy who I would see and he would walk around, um, the apartment complex and he was like, you know, he was like this kind of, um, you know, he was he was maybe like six feet tall, and he had like long dark hair, and uh, and he you know he had kind of like he he was not in super great shape or anything, but he would, you know, he had kind of like a dad bod or whatever. But he didn't care. He would walk around the apartment complex on his cell phone, on speaker, and uh, and and be in in sandals and jeans and no shirt, and he would walk around, and you could hear him talking, and and you could just tell from the conversations that he was having that he was going through a, a separation that was sounded like it was headed towards divorce, oh, yeah. you know? And, uh, and it was always fascinating to like witness him wa- pacing around like the grounds of the apartment complex, like walking with his shirt off, you know, you, um, you know, you're probably familiar with this con like very much here in Phoenix. And in, uh, I bet it's true in Las Vegas is like the apartment complexes aren't like, these enclosed buildings, but rather like kind of open concept, you know, yeah, it was like breezeways like the Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, I could just like listen to this guy talking and, and you could hear that he was like really frustrated um, with his, uh, you know, with his wife. And it sounded like she wasn't as interested in like getting things back together as he was, which is a sad story. But um Anyway, that guy was that guy was interesting, but also the his aesthetic of like, kind of like this long haired guy with no shirt on and a jeans and sandals. <laughs> yeah, on like speakerphone walking around like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely um, for sure for sure yeah man um there's definitely like and I I mean the reason we this is a long way to get to it but I just mean like the kind of the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet is one, obviously the most famous scene in the entire, you know, maybe history of literature. Sure. Is that kind of balcony scene. Uh, Romeo kind of watching the light as he's coming out of the tower that he knows Juliet is in where he kind of comes out of the dark, right? The line is, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks is the most famous line in the entire play. It is the East and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. Uh, 
absolutely just unbelievable. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's kind of, and I think just like there's something inherently romantic about a tower, about a balcony going to somebody's window and shouting up to them. Marlon Brando in the street, streetcar yes. named Desire, just shouting up to them say anything john cusack holding that boom box like just kind of the there's something sneaky about it one right the kind of high school young love when you're sneaking in and out of each other's rooms and stuff like that uh you know all of that <clears throat> there's just something so romantic about towers like like going up into a tower like climbing a tower to get to this girl I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Did you ever have, did you have to did you ever like sneak your girlfriend into your house or out of your house or you ever sneak out? Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. And it was always like kind of a romantic thing, right? Like the kind of passionate thing that was I me. She speaks, Oh speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night, being over my head as his winged messenger of heaven an angel just unbelievable yeah yeah um well it and and the thing that it, that that amazes me is um you know like from the 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 Boz Lorman adaptation is like how how fresh he was able to make all of this material with the with like i mean and and and, and so you know he made like everything that he did in that film was it was like a choice you know there was no there was nothing like kind of left outside of his um you know like like it was like left to chance you know or 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 right. just oh that's there let's just use that you know um i don't know how did how did it how did that movie strike you this time around what i i actually liked it more this time around than i did previously I'm not a huge Lerman guy, but one thing I think he did that makes that version from 96 hold up so well. Yeah. He, the fact that they kept all of the dialogue the same, that all of the dialogue was the kind of Shakespearean English. Yeah. Keeping that allowed him to kind of do so much wild stuff with the kind of modernizing it in other ways while keeping that kind of dialogue is what makes that movie still hold up today. I think if they had modernized the language or told the story, you know, the kind of same Romeo and Juliet story, but didn't use the Shakespearean language, uh, it wouldn't hold up. It would be corny. It would be, you watch it now, I think, and it would be like, mm, you know, some of those choices that like you said, even in the beginning, that kind of Jamie Kennedy in the beginning. The, yeah. Do you bite your thumb at me, sir? Like, uh, <laughs> yes, I bite my thumb, but not at you. It's very nine. I mean, like, it's extremely 90s. Oh, the Hawaiian it's, shirts. Yeah. Yeah. But I think this, like, like kind of like the television, you know, starting and ending with television and, uh, and making it kind of about, you know, like in many ways, I felt like it was about L.A. L.A. is seen through television helicopters and and also just like the idea of like helicopters, police helicopters buzzing around Los Angeles because it's like kind of fresh off of the uh, the L.A. riots, you know, of the early 90s and and O.J. and, you know, all of that stuff. I, f I felt like that was all there. But um, but you're right in that keeping the dialogue Shakespeare's dialogue definitely helps to ground it in something right. more timeless, but it's nice to see something that also, you know, reminds me of that time period. And, and if you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored, uninterrupted full access to this podcast become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board that's right heavy board is made possible 
by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. Was immersed in that time period in a way like that um, other stuff kind of isn't. And um, the thing that I didn't get when I was a kid was that like how constructed it was and how how much costume and color and set and size there is to that movie. Yeah. And that was the way to go. I mean, that yeah. was the way to go, the way to make it interesting to a new audience, to young people. And I mean, you know, I mean, there's really like, I mean, and I, and I was shocked because, you know, back in the day, I didn't really recognize who some of these other players were that were in, in the film. Um, but, you know, I mean, what, what, a what a what, what raw material he had to work with, like with Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes as well, who was really kind of like the archetypal 90s girl. And she, she was extremely young, you know, yeah. and, and very, very talented for being so like, I don't even know. She probably was like 15, I think, maybe in that movie. Like, like her, the actress was 15, you know? Yeah. And I think <clears throat> the way that Lerman seemed to pay special attention to the music, like yes. when they're talking back and forth, even when he's doing the banter, especially with the banter between like Romeo and Mercutio and all like the group of friends, the back and forth, that's very kind of their music. They're rhyming each other's lines. Like they're almost like completing these kind of like, that's such an essential part of it. And I think a lot of people tend to uh like for for example in the zeffirelli version there isn't as much attention paid to that in terms mm -hmm. of like how the blinds rhyme and bounce off one another there's a rhythm to the entire play from yeah. the very beginning and like there's this thing that people do when they're acting shakespeare is they try to over dramatize the lines you know mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and that song that very often messes up that rhythm because you're trying to over dramatize it uh, to emphasize it, you know, and give like a spin on it because this has been done to death. Actors love doing this, but I think the other reason actors love doing it is because of that, because it forces you to work with everybody else in the scene like so seamlessly with that sound as you have to hit the mark almost but with your speech, like with the dialogue you're performing yeah. and also your mark on the stage or where the movie or whatever you're performing it in. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's just, and you know, sometimes that just maturity, I think for terms of like an actor as an artist, that's just like maturity, understanding that. But like, you know, actors love doing Shakespeare because I think it gives them that opportunity to, uh, I don't know, just like do something that you wouldn't that you can only do through a Shakespearean kind of back and forth the Shakespearean dialogue the monologue the soliloquies the kind of self-dramatizing the self-overhearing as Bloom would say right explaining to the audience your kind of psychological change and weighing the options and most famously Hamlet Hamlet right the kind of is that a dagger I spy like when he's talking to himself and he's kind of like on stage by himself during that scene. I mean, I mean, yeah, that just, that is always huge, huge factor, but well, I did. Yeah. And I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. I would yeah. say like, yeah, I mean like it, it really gives an actor an opportunity to rely on the material and not have to, I mean, really do overact, I guess I would say. Yeah. But yeah, I like, I don't know, the romantic shit, like, just like little lines, like, like when they're at that balcony and she's like, they're talking, they're about to go away. They've kind of devised their little plan to marry each other so that they can fuck. And, yeah. um, like, she's like, Juliet calls him back. Right. And she's like, um, uh, 
oh, I've forgotten what I've called you back for. And he's just like, well, let me stand here till you remember, right? Let me yeah. stand here till thou remember it. Die hard romantic. Die hard romantic. Nothing else matters but this exact moment, this exact love. I'll stay up all night if I have to, you know, kind of thing. Yes. But I also yep. wanted to ask you about um, Friar Lawrence. Because mm -hmm. doing it this time, reading it this time, I started to notice, I was like, this is maybe all Friar Lawrence's fault. Like, <laughs> like, like he devises the plan. He agrees to marry them uh, in secret. And then he devises the plan to like fake her death. And then he devises all of that. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. You know, once, once you know, he kind of launches them on this path because, um, you know, Romeo co goes to see him, you know, after he, uh, you know, after he falls for, uh, for, for Juliet, you know, and, uh, and he is at first kind of like, oh, you know, like, didn't, you know, weren't you head over heels, like, just for, uh, for Rosalind before, you know, like, what? What are you really like? Is, how serious is this? And then he sees, I, like I was saying before, um, you know, I think that he sees the uh, the possibility. Um, I don't know for, like I said, like kind of healing the the this problem that exists in the um, within the, the community between the, the families. Um, but then I think I think part of it is, you know, now that he's set this into motion, like, I think he just kind of has to finish it is kind of how I see it. Yeah, and his kind of ending, like, soliloquy at the end where he explains it all to the prince and, like, the people and stuff, like, he's almost kind of owning up to it, you know? Like, yes. kind of like, oh, this was all my fault. Um, but, yeah, I was just thinking, like, he sets it up, too. Like, when we first kind of he agrees to do this kind of stuff like that famous line, these violent delights have violent ends. I think that's act mm. two, scene five. Yes. Uh, and it's like at they like devise this plan and like, okay, so he's kind of foreshadowing and setting up this kind of, it's going to be a violent end as we have this violent delight. <clears throat> do you remember, um, there was, uh, God, I can't remember if it was the Zeffirelli one or. So when Romeo goes to see him the first time and he's telling him about Romeo or and he's telling him about um, Juliet, he's like, Holy St. Francis, what a change is here. Is Rosalind that thou didst love so dear so soon forsaken? Young men's love then lies not truly in their arts, in their hearts, but in their eyes. Like, you know, <laughs> like, like pause, you know, obviously leaving it up to us to, you know, fill in where young men's love actually lies, not in their hearts, but in their eyes. Um, <laughs> that was cool. Um, Another sex yeah. joke. Like, there's so much sex, sexual humor in this play, too. And I think that's something that you don't pick up on when you're young in high school and they're forcing you to read it and stuff, like kind of how raunchy the play is. Yeah. And like how entertaining it would be to a crowd in like Elizabethan England, like with all these kind of, and I think Lar Larman really captures that with kind of, they do like crotch grabs and stuff while they're like talking about like the kind of prime my pump, like uh kind of right things like that. Like it's talking about their, their dicks. And yeah. that, that line there, these violent delights have violent ends. And in their triumph, die, like fire and powder, which, as they kiss, consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in its own deliciousness, and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore, love moderately. Long love of so Too swift arrives, as tardy as too slow. And I think that that point stands out to me in this reading, where it's like, yeah, like, it's just going to burn up, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not, this is not a thing that's built to last and also there is that kind of double meaning where it's like you know he's saying 
this will actually end in violence, which it does do. Um, yeah, and Friar Lawrence is uh, setting it all up for everyone. Sure is. But, but yeah, I was just thinking about that, like kind of like he basically caused all of this and then like kind of his correspondence not reaching Romeo and all that. But also like yeah. Friar Lawrence is kind of like the more of a father figure to Romeo than even like his own father. Yes. Like his own father kind of running away from when we first meet Romeo. It was the line something like, is that my father who left so hastily away or something like, uh, yeah not wanting to see Romeo and then he's going to Friar Lawrence for the father figure. And even like when Friar Lawrence, like after he gets banished for killing Tybalt and he's like crying on like Friar Lawrence's floor, like Friar Lawrence is like basically calling him a bitch. Like, like basically like you need to buck up young man. Yes. Well, it's, um, to me that's striking at the, um, you know, this line at the end that, um, you know, the, the prince says, this letter doth make good the friar's words, their course of love, the tidings of her death. And here he writes that he did buy a poison of a poor apothecary, and therewithal come to this vault to die and lie with Juliet. Where be these enemies? Capulet Montague, see what a scourge is laid upon your hate, that heaven finds means to kill your joys with love. And I, for winking at your discords too, have lost a brace of kinsmen. All are punished. That line, see, um, see what a scourge is laid upon your hate that heaven finds means to kill your joys with love. I don't know what I, I, I don't know what to make of that, but it seems to me it's just saying like it was these young people's love that ultimately punishes all of you for your for your hate and violence. I don't know. Is that I, I don't I wish I had a more. uh I don't know. I, I don't have as sophisticated a, a read on some of these lines, but that does strike me. No, I mean, absolutely. I think it is. And I think it's, it's, it's the theme of this is the two extremes, sex and death. So life and death. And then, yeah, love and hate the kind of, that's where most of the drama comes from in this play too. And in the story overall kind of, I mean, like, I was going to ask you this kind of like, you know, the idea of like killing oneself over a woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Incredibly romantic. It's like this idea of death, but then like framing it in terms of an act of love, right? You're killing yourself as an act of love. It is the most extreme romantic kind of gesture. I don't know. I'm just thinking like Van Gogh cutting off his ear. I mean, you know, men willing to harm themselves um, in order to be with a woman. Yes. Like, uh, just how common that is, too. Yeah. Or killing themselves over a woman, right? Like the Anthony Bourdain. Oh, God. Uh, How unfortunate. Yeah, like it just, it's, in, I think that's, you know, I, I don't know for a fact, but I'm just guessing here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if like the <clears throat> leading cause of like male suicide or something is something like that, like over some type of relationship. Divorce, maybe. Divorce or, yeah, something blowing up like that. Um, yes yes I mean it's gotta be it's gotta be um I think it's uh I don't know you know that that's that thoughts um fortunately never you know never crossed my mind fortunately you know but <laughs> it's it's definitely gotta be the uh the leading cause of male suicide I would guess is like divorce yeah, I would. I. It's interesting too. I, I this one psychologist was saying this that he was saying like most men that he sees that are suicidal or men that have committed suicide, he's like it isn't because of depression or anything like this. We're like, oh well, they're mentally ill. He's like, no, 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 like they're not actually. 
his letter. It's actually, if you think about the perspective, it's very rational where they feel that they've reached some point that they can't escape, you know, like they've reached some dead end that there's, they see no way out of. He said, that is more of the cause for male specifically, like just male suicide than anything else. It isn't like this mental health or depression. It is like actually like kind of a rational idea of I've, I've, I don't know, reach this point and there's no way out. So I'm just going to do this. Um, and when he said that, I was just like, man, that is, why do men do that? <laughs> why, why are we? Yeah. Because I mean, is there, is there, I mean, is there really anything that you can't get out of in some way or another or right, like yeah. live through, you know, I mean, even if you're like bankrupt financially, I wonder if it has more to do with like, I don't know, shame. Yeah. You know, like I made a mess of things. Like I failed. I failed as a man, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, go speaking of it's a wonderful life. I think that's what George feels in the beginning of the movie, you know? Yeah. Cause I think that's a very common thing that, and this is something I know I always bring up Jordan Peterson on this podcast, but just kind of the, this is something I think Peterson touches on in the modern context of that kind of desperation or the failure of a man as a man, like as a man, you feel like you didn't live up or failed at becoming what you were supposed to be or a complete man or whatever it is kind of, that's a unique sensibility to the kind of masculine dis- disposition and maybe the kind of more sensitive young men or romantic young men tend to, I don't know, be like more prone to that or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I do, I do think like it's, um, uh, <laughs> I think it's, uh, I, yeah, it, it seems to me like there's, there's maybe like something that I'm like a compulsive behavior or something like that. You can't stop. You can't escape, you know, like whether it's like out, al- like alcoholism or drug addiction, I could see that where it's just like, I see no way of stopping myself from doing this. I could see that as being, uh, a, a, a reason somebody might, might, kill themselves um i'm not saying it's a good reason i i I honestly don't think there is a good reason really for the most part um because i've thought i've certainly thought about it where i was like well what 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 would be the circumstances you know where i would take my own life like i feel like that's just not a possibility it's not a possibility be better if i'd never been born (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for sure dude uh yeah like, w- w- what did you make of the zeffirelli film did you watch them in order i ended up watching them like i read the play and then i watched the zeffirelli first and then i watched the lerman or uh, yes same. Same. yeah what, what did I you thought, think of it I, I really enjoyed it i really thought the zeffirelli was was a fun way to experience um this play and i really thought the acting was really strong um, in the ensemble, I thought that um, uh, Mercutio was was phenomenal, was absolutely phenomenal, and I liked kind of I liked seeing it in in that context. It made it I don't know. It, th- th- there was something like very kind of um, Italian about it. I yeah. felt like, um, and and it. Yeah, I, I I really enjoyed that. Uh, you know, and I, I thought I thought the, it was interesting to see these young people from from that era, you know, handling this material. And I mean, all in all, I think that my understanding of the actual words of Shakespeare, the actual dialogue itself, was better. Uh, like like I, you know, because I've seen. I actually saw the Romeo and Juliet, the Lerman Romeo and Juliet a few weeks ago or, or maybe a month or two ago. 
God, it couldn't have been that long ago, Andrew. It must have been really recently I'd seen it. And I was I was just more picking up I was just more taking it in visually than than being impressed by the dialogue. Um in in the the Zeffirelli version really I can see why they show it to kids in school. Like I could understand what they I could understand what the play was about really well. I know that sounds you need that. And 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 so the Zeffirelli film really gave me an understanding. And, and and watching it before rewatching the Lerman one, it actually helped me appreciate the Lerman one better because I understood it better. Yeah, I think yeah. that's true for a lot of Shakespeare stuff is that you do have to, if you don't have a good teacher that's walking you through it when you first encounter it, like <clears throat> you do have to see it performed because it does breed kind of context on top of what you were already reading, especially if you like, you know, haven't been trained to read this kind of language, which most people right. haven't when they're first encountering this. And it's like seeing the characters, their expressions, <clears throat> the emphasis on the certain words and things like that. Yeah. And even the Zeffirelli version, I mean, obviously they're separated by, you know, like what, 30 years almost. Um, yeah between the Zeffirelli in 68 and the Lerman in 96, it was much more play like, you know, where the sets were very minimal. Like it was a lot of, it was just that town square kind of just that, you know, Italian buildings and like the kind of town square. I got like kind of ballet vibes too. Mm -hmm. Like with yes, the tights. Too, that's the fight yes. scenes, like the choreography of the fights, um, they're almost kind of dancing around one another. True. Uh, I just got like a vibe of that. And I mean, I noticed this in a lot of movies, even earlier movies than this, usually from like the 50s, when, you know, television and film were becoming um, a more dominant medium than theater and like plays and stuff, you know, like... Um, the reason, you know, like old school movies and stuff that would only have like one room or whatever that they would be moving the camera in or something sitcom style today. Well, it's because sure. it was came out of like the theater, you know, where you only have this one room at a time on the set of like a stage, you know, <clears throat> before we could do the elaborate kind of, you know, fantasy set pieces or whatever. But yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of that vibe. Um, also, shout out to the nurse in the Zeffirelli version. The uh, the I looked it up. Uh, Pat Haywood plays the nurse mm -hmm. and just crushes it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just crushes that. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and people people will recognize Michael York. Yeah, um, Tybalt from I don't know. The, my first exposure to Michael York was was in Austin Powers, but he's also uh, in, in Cabaret, which is another great film and a great performance by him. I didn't realize that that was Laurence Olivier um, doing the narration, and Same, uh, yeah. I just saw him recently because I rewatched the Hitchcock film Rebecca that he's in, and uh, a, a tremendous interpreter, uh, cinematic interpreter. And I would assume stage, though I obviously never got to experience that. But uh, a fantastic interpreter of Shakespeare in his own right, you know, yeah. direct. He loved Shakespeare. Yeah, he like yeah. put himself in all those Shakespeare movies. He even did blackface for to play Othello in uh, <laughs> in that one. Wow. Um, uh, the, the National Shakespeare, the National Shake, uh, National Theater Company production. It's the whatever movie version where he's Olivier's. I think he directed it too, where he like cast himself as Othello and like put himself through full blackface kind of makeup. Yes. And people beat it up now for that. But I mean, the movie itself is good. Like, but yeah, Olivier was a huge Shakespeare. I mean, all these actors, they all like Denzel Washington, dude, huge Shakespeare dork. Like, that guy loves Shakespeare. He always wants to do Shakespeare roles. And uh, did you see the Macbeth, the recent Macbeth by, what was it, Joel Cohen or one of the Cohen brothers? No, no. 
It was okay. <clears throat> it, it was a little disappointing, but uh, you know, Denzel stars as uh, Macbeth and right. that, and then Francis McDormand. Um, I guess it was Ethan Cohen because I think he's the one that's married to Francis McDormand. Sure. Uh, she played you... Lady Macbeth, but. Have you ever seen this movie? It's um, it's an American independent film from the '90s. It's called Scotland, PA. No. Oh, it's like um, it resets um, Macbeth in like some town in Pennsylvania, like contemporary town in Pennsylvania, and it's pretty clever. It doesn't, you know, they don't use like, and and um, who's uh, is the is the inspector like the guy? So I think I think um Christopher Walken plays like they're supposed to be Macduff or whatever, but um I I think you should check it out. I think you would like it. No, yeah. no, no. <clears throat> I was gonna say. I mean, I like that. I like when they're well done too. I mean, dude, Ten Things I Hate About You. Great. Uh, one of the best kind of modernizing of you know the Taming of the Shrew I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, maybe it is just because I'm a millennial and I'm nostalgic for it, but I would watch that over and over again as a kid. Yeah, that's be- yeah, that's a that's a great one. That's a great one, but I need to go. I need to get back on. I need to get back on a Shakespeare jag. You've got me. You got me started here, dude. I was about to do the same, dude. Like I'm about to try and do some more Shakespeare. I was like, man, I really want to reread King Lear now, and I have this huge thing. And I've never. I haven't read all of Shakespeare. Um, have you read The Tempest? Uh, yeah, I have. Yeah, not in a long time though, but. Um... I've read pretty much every... I haven't read the history plays, so I haven't really read the Julius Caesar kind of plays. <clears throat> um, and I haven't read all the comedies or all the dramas, but I've read most of them. But I want to go back and like do all of them. And I have them all in this huge book here. So I was like, yeah, I want to do like a huge Shakespeare... Jag? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah uh, but sounds- also, yeah, so yeah, we didn't talk about Olivia Hussey. Livia Hussey as Juliet. Oh yeah. What What do you think? I I mean, no issue. No issues. Really good. Oh yeah. Really good. Um. I remember seeing it in high school. Like since this was the one they showed in high school, like I remember thinking she yeah. was so hot as like a fifteen year old boy watching yeah. this. Like. Yeah. I didn't that... want to say. I didn't want to say anything about that just because of how her age when when the movie was made but obviously incredibly beautiful and um i don't know you know she didn't she, her career was weird yeah she wasn't like a prestige dramatic actress she was like i don't know um she did various things i think i i don't want to i i mean i certainly don't want to disparage her career um she and um and she's actually his you know she's actually hispanic her real name is osuna really um yeah yeah she's she, she was born in in argentina Damn. and mm. um but i i read this weird thing that apparently her and leonard whiting who plays romeo actually ended up filing a lawsuit against paramount in 22 in december yeah. of I saw that, yeah. And I, I don't, I don't know if I want to comment on that or not, but the it got thrown. It was dismissed. Yeah, of course it was. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. It's, it's. It was part of the Me Too fervor. Um, right. They were claiming some form of abuse or whatever during the sex scene in Romeo and Juliet in this version. Which I mean, the dude, the sex scene in this, like rewatching it, like I thought it was hornier when I was a kid. Maybe I'm just desensitized to it now or whatever. Yeah. Like you barely even see anything. Like, you see a shitload of Romeo's ass. Yeah, yeah. You you get a little side boob, and then I'm like, oh, and they're filing a lawsuit over that. Like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there was more that was cut or something that like they forced them to film. But I'm just thinking myself like. Whatever, dude. Like, I mean, I think they just saw an opportunity, you know, to, <laughs> to get a little easy cash, and they went for it. Yeah, know, whatever. That's where we are at in society. But um, how was I going to say? Uh, 
Um, yeah, well, you know, Zeffirelli, he was, um, he was a gay man. I was going to um, say, I was going to see if he was, I didn't know, but I was like, he seemed gay from how much we linger on Romeo's ass in that scene. He I was, was gay, like, but, is Geffarelli gay? Probably. Like, but, but he was also, he was also a very conservative ca- Roman Catholic who, um, supported, you know, uh, supported the church's views on those kinds of issues, social issues. Hmm. And so there was like a, you know, there was obviously, and you know, he directed that movie, Jesus of Nazareth. And like, he was a devout Catholic. Um, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it, you're like, Oh man, I would really like to go back and watch, uh, the Zeffirelli, um, what was the one that he did do with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor? Um, he he did one of those Shakespeare movies with Burton and Taylor. Uh, was it Taming of the Shrew? Or was it, it was. I think it was. I think you're right. It seemed like uh, I didn't know for a fact, but like the stylistically, they seem similar. That's why it jumped yeah. out at me. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. I would. But they lo- did I the Tempest lo- too, didn't they? Together. Or am I making that up? I mean, I mean Burton and Taylor. Right, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, I don't so, know. I don't so. know. I'm not. There's one film adaptation of The Tempest that I'm, uh, that I'm familiar with, and it's actually an incredible movie. It's called Tempest, and it takes place in modern times. And John Cassavetes plays Prospero, um, and it's you, you, I, I really liked it. But I like, but I'm a big John Cassavetes fan as well. So. What did yeah, you man. think of uh, of Leonard Whitting playing Romeo, his portrayal? He was fine. You know, I mean, I wasn't like... He kind of reminds me of like a modern... Like at times I was getting like, is this guy... Is this like Chalamet or whatever? Or is this... Uh, what's the other guy's name? The guy from High School Musical, I forget his name. Uh, Zach Efron? Yeah, I was like... I, I got a little Efron vibes or whatever. But I wasn't... I wasn't overwhelmed by his performance. Like I said, I, I, I really was, I really was more impressed with like ev- all the other players, whether it was, um, like you were saying the nurse who was great. Uh, you know, I, I've already called out Mercutio. I thought he was amazing. Like, okay, wh- here's why the Mercutio in this one was good because he captured both the, like the, big brother seriousness of Mercutio, but also that kind of like playfulness, but he didn't go too far with it. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't turn Mercutio into full blown jester mode, you know, but that's what makes Mercutio interesting though, is that there <coughs> is that duality. That death scene is so great in the Sufferelli version. Yes when Mercutio's dying and he's making the jo- and the way they frame it so that he's joking, he's joking, he's joking. And then he's kind of his face. He's like, fetch a surgeon. Like, you know, like just, yep. and they like that kind of like awkward hesitation of, Oh, Mercutio's fine. Mercutio's fine. But then all like, Oh, he's dead. Like, yeah, that actor did it great. The kind of transition. Cause it's sudden and it, it's hard yeah. to do too. Like, but yeah, I agree with you on like Whitting. I mean, I'd never really heard of that guy. Had he done anything else like Leonard Whitting or, or mm. you know? Well, he left Hollywood pretty early on, I think, and stopped um, acting in Hollywood. He would have uh, to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think he, I don't think he tried to make a long go of it um, in his, uh, in his career uh, as a as a film actor. I think he did a lot of stage in England, and I'll say this. For all the for all the visual appeal and, and quite frankly the visual gen- I mean the visual genius of the of the Lorman adaptation, just these actors that are in the Zeffirelli version, like, and probably Zeffirelli himself. Uh, although I don't know that, um, they just they just had a better understanding and a better handle on this material and on this dialogue, and they didn't have to go so fucking hard. You know, the, 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 I feel like the, I feel like the Mercutio death scene and Romeo's subsequent, um, confrontation with Tybalt is less, 
like, yeah, you know, like Leonardo, to, you know, like um, the guy who's playing Mercutio in the Lorman one screaming, you know, uh, and then and then Leonardo, Leonardo to crap. DiCaprio like, <laughs> really, really kind of like you know like screaming lots of screaming and and these folks have a better handle on the material and let the material do a lot more of the talking um, in this film I feel yeah yeah and that's one thing I guess people always criticize Lerman for is the kind of over stylized stuff that he yeah. does um yeah. there are parts of it that i actually really thought worked in the 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 96 version with leo but i think the yeah. same thing like comparing leo dicaprio to leonard leo whitney uh leo yes. he's young you know leo's young in that role and he gets a little shouty uh but overall i thought he was good casting for it even agreed yeah, like even Leonard Whitting in the in the sixty eight version is is, I see why they cast him as Romeo. Sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I've just seen too many versions of it, or like you know when like you're reading something and you have that picture of it in your head, and then when it doesn't match up to what you see on screen, when somebody else's interpretation of it, you know, you're almost like ah, like mm. yes. there's like. There is a slight edge to Romeo, I think. And like you mentioned this earlier, because of that romanticizing, it's almost a desperation in like the male psyche to over romanticize love in this way that Romeo would or does in the story. There's just a slight edge to him, I feel like, that <clears throat> is probably really hard to capture as an actor. I, I've done, you know, amateur acting, I've never done anything at the level of being in a movie. Uh, but then again, I mean, I see some people that go do movies all the time that <laughs> they can't act. Or yeah, whatever, but, yeah. Um, but you know, I did like theater and shit and it, yeah, I mean, that's hard to capture, but yeah, there's like a slight little edge to Romeo that I think Leo captures a little bit better in that, but maybe, but he goes slightly over the top because he's young at that time and, and kind of shouts to compensate for. I don't know. That's a, but yeah. What 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 did what did you think of the Lerman version? <clears throat> well, I mean, I mean, I was I was really kind of impressed with. I mean, I don't know. Well, like, where did Boz Lerman come from, and, and where did his confidence come from to make a movie that bold? And it's really bold, and you know, it's it has like a very um, theatrical sensibility. It understands, I guess, what, it, like how this how this movie could be interesting to anyone, is by like putting in a lot of motion, color, music, and so and it's so stylized and uh, and he's able to use costume to differentiate it between. You know, like he's he's able to help visual us visually understand what's happening, and 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 that was so important because the movie really is, I think, it's like for teenagers. Yeah, and it was a teenage made... sensation when it came. I was yeah. a little too young, but and, and and my point would just be like, that's an achie that's quite the achievement to make this material accessible, and not just accessible, but like for us to be able to understand it. No matter our level of comprehension of, of of already like of already knowing what the story is about, of understanding what the dialogue's about, he's able to tell this movie visually, and yeah. I think does a great job of it, and cr makes a lot of choices, and they aren't all they don't all hit, but every one of them is like a choice and an original choice at that, and so. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very impressed by the film. I don't think it's my, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that like everything about it rubs me the right way. Um, and then again, you know, like I said, it was made for teenagers, but I think it's, it's quite the accomplishment and, and I'm, and I'm going to go out on a limb and, and maybe people can accuse me of being a contrarian. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but but I really groove. I I groove more with Zeffirelli. Like in terms of like, what do I want to? How do I want to experience this story? And how do I want to experience this dialogue? And just what's my mood? What is my mood? And my mood is more at this point in my life, Zeffirelli. And quite frankly, I didn't have an appreciation for what Zeffirelli was doing in terms of costume, in terms of choreography, and also, of course, the acting. Yeah. I didn't get that when I watched, you know, I thought, oh, the, you know, like I just kind of thought this is dry and old fashioned, but it's, it's not. But then again, um, you know, the, the Romeo, the, the Lurman one is so MTV. It's yeah. so empty, but in a good, but, but in a good way, that's not, I'm not denigrating that. That was at the peak of, you know, the, the kind of like the confluence of Hollywood storytelling and what we learn from the music video. Yeah. What we learn from the big epic music video. Peak TRL. Like, yeah. Yeah. It just peak like that was the coolest shit. And even the visual stuff, like my, the favorite visual stuff with Lerman's was that scene when he's in the tomb, which they kind of make like a funeral home kind of thing. The red crosses that line the entire like aisle as he's going down like to her kind of coffin. Yeah. I was just like, this is so stunning and it works even though it's so like neon, like bright, like you would never think of to put this in a Romeo and Juliet adaptation. For some reason it just works. Yes. But then like, you know, I have a look kind of like I'm hit or miss with Lerman. I think he's kind of hit or miss in all the stuff he does. Like, I think there are parts of it that are really good. And overall, the product can be good, like the final product. But like, there's always little things that I'm like, oh, you're so stylized. There's just things that I'm like a little quirked on. For example, yeah. dude, he got points against him. No balcony scene. He took away the balcony scene. And I get it. You know, it's cliche at that point. Like, it had been, you yes. know, 500 years of people putting on this play and making movies. He was trying to freshen it up a little bit. But I was just like, there are some things that you just can't freshen up. Like, no matter how, because it's just too iconic. It's almost, no matter how you try to go against it. So, for example, something like that ba balcony scene, if you try to freshen that up or change our expectations or something it's almost disappointing because it's just so expected that you there's no getting around it you just have to bite the bullet as a filmmaker and kind of give the audience that and do it your way obviously and, and make it fresh however you want or can but yeah for that when like he fell instead of having the balcony scene i was like oh i was like, oh. I, was like I want yeah. to have romeo looking up be like be soft what light yeah. through yonder window breaks it is yeah. the sun, or is the east, yeah. and Juliet is the sun. Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the thing, though. It's like, I, 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 that's the thing is that I admire the the guts that it took to take on this material and not really be, and not be at all a household name at that point in time, you know? Yeah, and I like that he wasn't as precious about it, too. Like, he wasn't yeah. precious about it with the legacy and all of that. You can get over precious and try to make it, too. There was a Pride and Prejudice remake, one of the more recent ones, wasn't it? Or was it one of the ones in the 90s that it almost is too precious with the material, I feel like. But then again, I, I need to rewatch these. I haven't seen them in a while. But I, I really like, I, I mean, and you may be talking about this version, but I'm a really big fan of that, like 2000. The Kira Knightley. Uh, I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. That I wasn't talking about. Yeah, that one's good. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think. Yeah, man. Mr. Darcy, I... dude. Yep. Isn't Mr. Darcy uh, Tom from Succession in that one? Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's hilarious. Yeah. Dude, um, I, that actor, oh, I don't even know his name, dude, that actor, but he's fucking great. <laughs> he should be in more it, stuff. Like, <laughs> Well, and I really like Kira Knightley. I think, Me I too, think yeah. She's great. Um, and she's she's really beautiful in like a very specific way, you know? Like, she's <laughs> not like this beauty queen, but she's also like, I don't even want to say girl next door, because she's not that either. She's like too pretty for that, like... 
Yeah. She just has this aura about her, particularly at that time, the Pirates of the Caribbean, the Pride and Prejudice of that time, the kind of, the things she was making. Yeah. She was just just smoking hot. What? She uh, was. (laughs) Yeah, bro. What what do you make of, uh, of, um, of Leo and, uh, and Claire Danes in, in the title roles? Um, I think, um, you know, like I was saying, I think, I think Leo is a little, um, well, I don't know. You know, you, you made a great point where, um, I don't know. There is something like really like that, that, like desperate teenage romantic sensitive boy. Like it's very, very, um, yeah, like it's, it feels true to life. And, and so I don't, I don't, I don't ding him. Uh, I don't ding him for that. And I think the look that he has is kind of perfect. Like, I don't think it could have been really anybody else. Yeah. And I mean, he's so iconic and Romeo's so iconic. And then, I mean, I just think that Claire Danes could do no wrong from around, like from her early career. I thought she was fantastic. I think the maturity is like her maturity and being able to play this role is really striking. Yeah. And I think again, like it's a, Nobody else could have done this. I think you could have only gotten somebody who is like, I don't know, exceptionally gifted for a young person, and and she is, and um, she's one who's had mm-hmm. like a, it seems almost maybe maybe it's the Juliet curse where like it feels like her career should have been bigger. Post Agreed. that role, because I mean, you know, I saw her in um, what was the show uh, Homeland? Homeland? Yeah, Never she was. It. She's fantastic like she's just gotten better as she's gotten older as like an actor you know like she's great in that and that's a more you know more modern role and stuff and she has to play like kind of a a big range a much bigger range than just like a teenager in love blinded by love or whatever but like still i was always just like maybe it's like a cursed role to get cast as juliet in a big shakespeare rendition if you end up like olivia hussey or claire danes with your career like you would think they would be huge, uh, have these huge careers after it, but then they don't. Yeah, well, you know, you yeah. just kind of wonder, like, how, how do how do these things? Why do these, these things go the way they go? I mean, is it is it because uh, of her agent? Is it because people think of her as so? Because she was such like a. You know, she was in my so-called life, and she was so young. Right. And then this, she was so young, and people are like, oh, "This is not an ad- like I can't see this woman in this adult role or whatever." And and they kind of dismiss. But yeah, man. I mean, I think that's a that's a good question because. Yet you would think that that she was headed headed for a, a huge career, a, like a kind of like a Meryl Streep, yeah, kind of kind of arc, and that didn't happen. Um. And maybe she's okay with. Uh, I'm sure she got enough money from that movie that she never had to work again. Like if she yeah, didn't yeah. want to, yeah. Because that mm-hmm. was one of those movies that I remember. I was a little too young, but I had an older sister, so mm-hmm. I was like six or so, I was about seven or eight when that movie came out, and then my sister was like thirteen. You know, so prime yeah. age for that. Like she saw it in theaters, you know, a bunch of times with friends and things. And I remember she got the soundtrack. That's how I knew the soundtrack and like the the images and like the kind of cover art on that soundtrack and the big VHS box that we have when it came out on video eventually. But I was just thinking like this was pre Titanic too, right? For Leo, wasn't yes. Titanic the year after? So that was like, was this the first? Yeah, like heartthrob role for Leo, like big. Yeah, I, I don't remember where I'd heard of him prior to this. Um, Arnie and what's eating Gilbert Grape, or what? What was the what was the first one you said? Uh, Arnie and and what's eating Gilbert Grape. Yeah, what's eating Gilbert Grape? That would have been the one yeah. that that. But he was also on the show briefly uh, that I watched when I was a kid called Growing Pains. It was like a television sitcom. Kirk Cameron. I mean, he was really born into the life, but. Yeah, but I, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, I just, I can't, at this point in my life, I can't picture anybody else being in either of those roles. And, and fortunately, you know, the, the, they're, 
the ensemble that they're surrounded by is so heavy with different characters and obviously like loads and loads of talent that young people, it takes some of the pressure off of this role, whether it's, um, you know, whether it, it's those kids that are in Zeffirelli or it's this movie, you know. And I was thinking the Mercutio in Larman, he was the actor. I can't think of his name, but he was in a lot of shit in the 90s. He was. He was, in, he was in Oz, right? That, right. Yeah. He was the, the guy the in the wheelchair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that narrates like the, he like narrates the whole series. Yeah, he does. Hey, look, um, look, uh, Andrew, I, I think I need to like go and, and get some dinner before. For sure, you know, bro. Don't hit the sack, so. Yeah, yeah. Final thoughts, Brendan? Any final thoughts on Romeo and Juliet or either of these versions? I think I might, for listeners, do like a um, a deep dive on Romeo and Juliet films. I like to do that sometimes uh, yeah. for a bonus something. But yeah, final thoughts on anything, Brendan? Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare, Lerman, well, Zeffirelli. Yeah, Brendan, well, I th- Brendan's heart and soul. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, when... The, you know, the I, this is a cautionary tale about, um, you know, the adults in uh, in the lives of these kids, <laughs> because, uh, you know, like they're unsupervised and, and they have their own ideas about the world. And, and I think they're a little bit trying to escape um, their their families and, and the conflict that they see. Um, I, it's a wonderful play. And, and I, I think that anybody who's who read it or pretended to read it <laughs> high school should go back and take a second look and, uh, you know, and maybe start with, uh, I, you know, and, and maybe start with the Boz Lerman one and work your way backwards. See how that, see how that goes. Yeah. But, um, or even like just, you know, this is one of those plays that's always going on at like a local theater group oh. or something like, cause it's a great one for actors <clears throat> just, you know the tickets to that. If it's like a local one, probably pretty cheap. Take a girl yeah, out. Take a girl. Take somebody out, listeners, to go see that uh, local college or whatever doing it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. I every time I go and see Shakespeare in um, in person, I'm rewarded. Exactly. Yeah, I'm rewarded, and uh, I'm just looking. I'm trying to see wh- where am I going to go see where am I going to go see Shakespeare next. And I was just Googling it. Um, I'm trying to find. There's a. Who's this? The, the Southwest Shakespeare Company. Where are they? Where are they located? 30 years we've been Arizona's standard bearer for classical theater. Hell yeah. Even Arizona has a standard bearer. Oh, they're right. They're right here in, in the east east side of Phoenix. There you Hell go. yeah. What, what, what do they got going on here? Oh shit! They even do plays at um, Taliesin West, which is was Frank Lloyd Wright's house in the desert. So we got some we got some Merchant of Venice coming up here next in the spring at Frank Lloyd Wright's house. That's a great one. Uh, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> great little date night for all those out there in Arizona. In the South definitely, West. definitely. Yeah. So, but I'm inspired to go and 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 see some plays. Um, I always forget, you know, that it, that's an option. Yeah, the live theater too. Yeah, twelfth yeah. night coming up here in October. That's another good one to see live. Yeah, man, that sounds great. Uh, all right, drop your handles. Where can people find your stuff, Brendan? And Tales from the Mall. Okay, so if you want to like really explore the show, then you want to go to Patreon.com/slash Tales from the Mall. Um, there's a lot of content on there that's, you know, you can access for only $5 a month. Um, it's like a hundred and, you know, 69 episodes of the show, uh, 169 like interviews plus several, um, after hours, you know, like I think we've done 10 after hours episodes. You can hear Andrew in either case. Oh yeah. Um, so there's a huge archive going back almost three years. We'll have my three-year anniversary here in November. Um, on Twitter, I'm uh, at Luso, L-U-S-O underscore Brendan. And then on, on Instagram, t- 
tales underscore from underscore the underscore mall. Hell yeah. Get it out there, listeners. Give it a follow. Give it a like. Give it a listen. Go check it out. Again, I'm on there. Brendan's out there doing great stuff. Brendan, thanks for taking the time, man. This has been a lot of fun, as I knew it would be, dude. Little romantic boy summer. Absolutely. Thank you for thinking of me. I, I had a blast, and, you know, don't hesitate to think of me again in the future. Oh, yeah, we have to have you back, boy. That'd be awesome. Yeah, this has been another episode of Heavy Board. Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Board. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! In a big source of life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.